whole host of reasons why you should have done it. Uh, the fact is you chose not to do it and you blame others. That is incorrect and it's a misleading statement, sir. Okay, I beg to differ with you. Okay, wh where, where you did try to stop it? In my judgment, the tool to wake up the Philadelphia Housing Authority, as you would say, was to suspend the CAP funding in 1986 to the tune of some 30 some odd million dollars. They actually requested substantially higher than that. That was a tool that I exercised and subsequently was brought before one of your former colleagues, Congressman Bill Gray, who asked me to explain how I could deny the residents of public housing basic funding such as CAP. Right. I explained it and he concurred. Suspension of operating subsidy is absolutely not a tool that is available because it instantaneously, you're right, folks would wake up when the heat isn't on in February, they'll wake up. They may be dead by February 2nd, but that isn't a tool that we have available to us. Well, no, one of the things you could have done is make sure they did not get operating subsidies for units that didn't exist. But let, let, me, let me ask you something else. Did you have the authority uh, to at least recommend that this be taken over by someone other than the corrupt management that was operating this facility? I had that authority, and during that tenure, there were three executive directors during my time frame. Uh, and substantial movement with inside the board. There was Garfield Harris, there was Gregory Kern, and John Payone came on just no, immediately no, after me. You and I know that when you take over a facility, you take away the authority from the board. The board is not without mm -hmm. complaint here. I mean, I'm, you know, with all due respect, what we're talking about is not just an executive director. You know that and I know that. It has a board. And we have testimony that this was a board responding to political pressures. We have a lot of, of, of mm -hmm. testimony that documents that they were, they were not running this facility properly. Now, it's great to blame uh, Washington for this problem and to blame Philadelphia, but somehow I'm still grasping at wondering what your role was since you are here testifying. Right. That's what I'm wrestling and with. And what I'm saying, what I'm sharing with you is that certain steps were taken to the best of my ability at the time in the power that was vested in me by the taxpayer and by the administration to take those steps as a civil servant. No, no, I didn't stop, have please the stop power. Saying, please stop saying civil servant. Say what you were. We're all civil servants to the best of our ability. What you were was the director of the Office of Public Housing. That's what you were, sir. And as that's the not a contradiction. No, it, it, but what it is is a little more apt description because we're all public servants. Okay. But you had the authority. You were the director. If, if, I, if you would allow me at least a minute I would be able to explain precisely what authority I actually had. Okay. I had the power to make recommendations to a regional administrator. Right. I subsequently was vested with the power to sign off on budgets and comprehensive improvement assistance program funding. I exercised the power under comprehensive improvement assistance program funding in recognition of certain aspects, and the Inspector General, certainly if you invited him back, would testify to that, in, in recognition that certain aspects had to be addressed immediately. A task force was appointed in 1988 involving a number of civic leaders attempting to gain control of the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Taking over the Philadelphia Housing Authority was not an option to which I was able to address successfully with the HUD, the HUD secretary at the time. Okay, now I want to just pursue that. Okay. Because I'll just take your first power of recommendation. Did you ever recommend that, that you suspend this housing authority and you take it over? I recommended that the authority uh, scattered site units be taken over. No, just listen to my question. You can answer right. other otherwise. You can no, say I'm no and then, but no, because the problem is you almost forget what my question is. My question is, did you ever recommend that HUD take over the Public Housing Authority in Philadelphia, this very corrupt organization? Did you ever make that recommendation? 
not to the best of my knowledge, that we take over the Public Housing Authority of the City of Philadelphia. I did not view that, in my best judgment, as a viable option at the time. Now, let me ask you why. I'll tell you why. I, I represent uh, nine communities. One of mm -hmm. them happens to be uh, the community of Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. uh, before I became a congressman, HUD realized, and it wasn't on the trouble list, I think, as long as Philadelphia, that it needed to be taken over. Mm -hmm. It was taken over and run by HUD. They ran it. The local housing authority had no authority. Then it was given back uh, to the housing authority and kept on the trouble list. And, and HUD in New England made sure that they made progress to come out. So I don't know what you were doing, but I know what these guys were doing when they were looking at the Bridgeport Housing Authority, and they did their job well. I salute the Connecticut uh, HUD, I salute the, the Boston HUD, I salute Washington HUD for taking over Bridgeport and cleaning it up. I don't know why you people didn't do the same for Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. I've tried to uh, respond to you that indeed by suspending money by maneuvering the city into a position uh, that we thought was appropriate, by meeting with the resident leaders and, and, and requiring resident uh, leader management uh, to be present uh, at all meetings, by working closely with civic leaders to supply additional economic opportunities, to me those seemed like the most viable options. If I am wrong in retrospect, I'm not afraid to say that perhaps I was wrong. I'm also not dodging the bullet here. Well, no, I, and rather than but saying, to the best of your judgment, you didn't recommend, I think you didn't recommend, and rather than saying, I'm not trying to dodge or dodge, just tell me, should it have been shut down? Should you have At taken over? Should this have been taken over? In my judgment, still, no, it should not have been taken over at that time. Okay, what, what would it have taken? A new director. I think the okay. information that we subsequently received out of Mr. Feldman, Feldman's office, the strong involvement of the Inspector General, which by the way I recommended that the Inspector General look at a series of issues, and indeed they did, and stimulated the report that is before you today. Well, let, let me go back then. When you took CAP funds away, you had some basis for doing that. You didn't do it because you thought it was well run. No. I had the basis, as I stated in my testimony, that $51 million of previously approved CEP, most of it approved prior to my arrival, was lying dormant. So that's the basis for it? That was it? It, it wasn't, wasn't used. That's an enormous, no, powerful I, tool to transform the, the undecent, unsanitary, unsafe conditions what? that are there if it's applied correctly. Okay. What I'm really trying to grasp and understand so I have the facts and not be confused, which you don't want me to be confused, is to understand why a director of public housing for the region mm -hmm. neither knew what was going on, because you implied that you don't, didn't know fully until these final reports, number one, didn't know, and number two, didn't seek to use his authorities as best they were. And I can tell you, I would like to think that if you thought it was run badly, that you at the very least would have recommended that this, this agency be taken over for the good of all those tenants that sat to your left. And, and you're telling me that the basis for your withholding CF funds was not your knowledge that it wasn't run well. No, I th uh, that's, those are your terms and not mine. No, I you, said me, very uh, explicitly in my testimony that the basis was also some management indicators that we recognize were not, the, the authority was not being run well based on those management indicators, okay. which later became the national standard of indicators. Okay, okay, let's get into that. Okay. One part is the CAP funds. They hadn't spent CAP funds. I understand if they haven't set s spent CAP funds, why give them more? That, that seems clear. Mm -hmm. Now, what were these other things that you saw? The capability of doing annual inspections. They was hadn't not done there. annual inspections. Right. Okay. Now, that was not a management requirement under HUD until October of 1987, effective January 1988. Okay. That was instituted by myself and the region. Okay. Annual inspections were not required. Seems fantastic. Simply weren't required of housing authorities. Their significant problem with uncollected rents, or as HUD would call it, tenants' accounts receivables. And if I may add this to the testimony, 
One of the ironies of tenants' accounts receivables, uncollected rents, of which the Philadelphia Housing Authority in its latter years began to write off as much as $1 million of uncollected rents, is that HUD, in its management wisdom, includes uncollected rents as an asset of the authority. When you have, as we found in the district, several hundred people who have either left the district or have died, it's going to be very difficult to collect the rent from them. I don't and want, it's you, a I difficult don't want asset you to lose to your train of thought. I'm the, not. The annual inspection and the uncollectible rents, what else? I would say that the third management indicator that we used was the fairly consistent changing of the guard inside of the Philadelphia Housing Authority, a qualitative evaluative criteria. Okay. At the time, I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, Mr. Harris was leaving. The director of housing, the cabinet level post for the city, Julia Robinson, was leaving. And there was an acting executive director, or very soon to be an, an executive director. Okay, Lim anything else? Very close else? to that time. What, what else? Just those three? One of the indicators we did not use is work orders. And the reason why you don't use work orders, because I can generate 500 light bulb changes and call them electrical system failure under the current HUD monitoring system and get credit for that as a housing authority. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to, be, to lose your train of thought, but I first want to know the things you use, not the things you didn't use, because yeah. I, I bet there is a million things you didn't use. What, what, what did you use? Annual inspection, uncollected rents, mm -hmm. changing of the guard. What else? Status of the units they were that we had inspected, that the HUD staff had gone out and done a spot inspection of. Okay. I mean, just dealing with this issue, you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to know they were in pretty deplorable condition. Without a doubt. Okay. There so were some, I, I would add, there were, when you do a random sampling of 100 and you turn up 99, that's fairly fantastic. Now, some of those failures quite frankly, are light switches, um, an electrical outlet. Right. Others, 75% of them, as the IG showed and as our review showed, are so serious that it's fantastic, it staggers the mind. No, it, it, it does stagger the mind, it does. Uh, you got four, what else? That's what I used, no, to the best of my recollection. Okay. Plus the unobligated, unexpended position of the authority. In other words, the monies they had. The CAP money is $51 million, okay. right? So, I mean, this tells you it's a, it's a pretty troubled uh, uh, authority. But there was, uh, what about the units that, that no one was in? Uh, what, I mean, we have, you do have a turnover document to talk about mm -hmm. turnover. What, what was the problem there? In terms of vacancies? Yeah. The turnaround time is, 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 is tied to adequate annual inspections and a coordinated management information system, which is reflective of all those turmoil that was going on in the organizational structure, of getting a computerized system that tells occupancy when, when someone moves out, that the project site manager tells the occupancy people. No, you're, you're telling me something that I didn't ask, and, and, and you're free to do that, but, but it, tell me this. Why didn't you use, or because you, you said you stopped at five, why didn't vacancies come in here? Why, why weren't vacancies an issue? There were a lot of vacancies. There were a lot of vacancies. Yeah, and you knew that. Absolutely. And, okay. I, and I would say that I would probably say that I'm, I would say I'm staying corrected. We always look at vacancies. Those okay. are a normal okay, so pattern. Vac vacancies would be number six in this list. I mean, you're getting, Certainly. You're getting to, to a, a pretty impressive list of why maybe this should have been taken away from the Housing Authority. And, and let I'm me not just so sure I'm getting to that list. No, no, you are. You are, because you, with, with, with some help from your friends, you're, you're, you're getting, you've given us six reasons. The annual inspections mm -hmm. admittedly weren't happening, but not a requirement. Uh, uncollected rents was very high. The changing of the guard was happening quite often. Uh, the status of the units was pretty deplorable. Uh, CAP funds had not been spent and other monies and, and large vacancies. Was there anything else? Not to the best of my okay. recollection five years now, ago. Now, 
should the secretary of HUD known about this, or should you have known about this and I made recommendations? Know. Pardon me. Okay, first of all, I did know about okay. it, and I acted upon it by suspending thirty-four million dollars. No, that's the that's you've said it a hundred times. I know you did that. I am I am relatively impressed, but not very impressed. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm not very impressed is they didn't spend some of their money in years before that. That that that's why I'm not as impressed. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you didn't have all the other reasons. The, mm -hmm. CF, the fact they didn't spend CF funds would tell me, why do they need more when they already have money they haven't spent? Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't, I don't give you a lot of credit for that, with all due respect. I'm not asking for no, it. But, but you, no, you are, because you keep bringing it up as if it's a major, major thing that you did. I'm bringing it up because if you look at the pattern of HUD action during the same time frame in which there were similar problems elsewhere, that indeed the suspension of CF was a very aggressive posture at that time. Okay, uh, you've made that point to me, and I understand okay. that you think it was a major event, that you did that. What I'm still wrestling with is the fact that we had a housing authority that went from bad to worse, and you condemn the housing authority and you condemn people be uh, following you, and somehow I'm trying to understand the importance of, of a position that you hold, which is the regional director of the Office of Public Housing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm just trying to understand its relevancy in terms of dealing with this problem. Uh, you don't think, you've testified, you don't think you should have, should have taken over the housing authority or at least recommended that, that was a power you had. And I am really wrestling with why you didn't think that should happen, okay. given these things you've stated to I me. I had the recommendation power to take over the authority. In my judgment, at what I knew, and hindsight is always 2020, with what I knew ab absolutely concretely at the time, that the action that we took in the region was appropriate. I did state that I had recommended that the scattered site units, which are where the bulk of these missing 500 units are, be under a different authority. Mm -hmm. And at the time of the funding of the Southwark project, that a special master oversee Southwark because it was the largest single investment that was going to go on. So those are two fairly specific facts. Hmm. Well, I, I'll just conclude, uh, Mr. Chairman, by saying one of the things that amazes me, and it may be, it may be HUD down in, in uh, uh, it may be the regional office. It, uh, do they, is there a state office like we have in Connecticut? No, sir. Okay. There's just field offices and regions and. Wait, was there a field? But the field, so the field, we call it a state office in Connecticut. The field office is Hartford. What would be the field office for Philadelphia? Um, they were co-located at the time. It, it was located in the Philadelphia, and I over. There was an assistant. So you, housing manager so you oversaw that person, right? Essentially, the Philadelphia Housing Authority was under the field office, which reported up right. to me. So unlike the case of Connecticut field office, where you had a layer in Hartford and one in Boston, it was the same place. Right. So we unfortunately didn't in the bureaucracy, you had the same layer in terms of staff people. But yes, sir, it was in, okay. it was located geographically precisely in the same okay. building. Well, I, I, it, what I'm going to be wrestling with, and I'll be asking the, the Washington uh, group as well, is, is why wasn't this place shut down? A new authority and a, a new management put in place. And um, I, I guess I'm left with a feeling, uh, with no disrespect to you, that, that, that you had a role to play in, in seeing that that was done and chose not to as a public servant. As you say, but uh, I would say as the director of the Office of Public Housing, you, you had a little knowledge. And that knowledge would have been helpful for people in Washington to make sure they had as well uh, uh, knowledge and recommendations. Mr. Shea, may I sure. just respond? I had recommended in 1987 that the District of Columbia's public housing be taken over. Mm -hmm. That recommendation caused a tremendous furor in the department and subsequently was rejected. You know what? I think that's important to know, and I, I congratulate you for it, but the fact that, that there's a furor uh, because you recommended it is, what's the relevancy of that to me? Um, is that saying The relevancy is I can't override no, but the it's folks not, who said no. Yeah, but it's not to say you shouldn't have done it. No, because in my, in, yeah. I had more evidence that the district, for instance, the example that the misuse of a computerized system to generate voting uh, uh, populations for the incumbent mayor, 
that the system itself was run with reckless abandonment. Yeah. Well, it seems to me they both were candidates for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. I want to thank you, both of you gentlemen. If possible, I'd like to ask you to uh, stay around because we may have additional questions of you following the next panel. Um, our next panel consists of uh, Mr. John Payone, Executive Director of Philadelphia Housing Authority, Mr. Jonathan A. Seidel, Chairman, Board of Commissioners, Philadelphia Housing Authority. You could please raise your right hands. You solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Thank you. Please be seated. We're pleased to have both of you gentlemen. Your prepared statements will be entered in the record in their entirety. You may proceed any way you choose. We will begin with you, Mr. Seidel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jonathan Seidel, and I am the controller of the City of Philadelphia. I'm also the chairman of the Board of Commissioners of the Philadelphia Housing Authority, which as of last Thursday was placed under control of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. I am here today to describe what I have learned about public housing policy in large urban areas during the 26 months I have worked with the PHA. The most compelling lesson is that whatever happens in and to public housing, it will be real people who will bear the consequences. Men, women, and children are in a system which they do not control. But I am not the first person to come to this realization. 31 years ago, Jane Jacobs in her landmark book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, made the following assessment. The failure of low-income housing projects, she wrote, drastically affect the everyday lives of many people, especially children. Moreover, because they are too dangerous, demoralizing, and unstable within themselves, they make it too hard in many cases to maintain tolerable civilizations in their vicinities. That statement is as true today as it was then, and the intervening years have only shown the cost of failure to be more devastating to individuals and our society as a whole. Like all social problems, this one did not spring full-born into our lives. The history of the Philadelphia Housing Authority is a history of an evolving disaster. When it was founded in 1937 at the tail end of the Depression, the PHA was designed to provide temporary housing for those families who could not afford to own or rent their own homes or apartments. During World War II, it provided temporary shelter for defense workers and their families and after the war was a stopping point for young veterans waiting for housing market to catch up to the demand for new houses. Later it became home for those city dwellers who were displaced by urban renewal. Some of these people chose not to move from their old neighborhoods, but unfortunately many more could not move because of finances and or racial discrimination. The changing demographics of the public housing tenants produce far more complex problems than could be answered by merely providing affordable housing. As is always the case, events have outraged solutions, and now the solutions exacerbated the problems. One example was the siting of multiple high-rise apartment buildings in close proximity to each other. In Philadelphia, we have a project called Raymond Rosen, built in 1954, which consists of eight 13-story buildings set within a six-block square block area. I have come to learn that the design for this project was based on a project that the French government built for natives in its colony of Alger Algeria. This questionable design was further made more disastrous by the federal government. It allowed the number of high-rises to be doubled from four to eight. It removed all the residents' amenities from the plan, such as individual balconies and rooftop gardens. It reduced the size of the individual apartments and the amount of recreational space. The result was that all sense of neighborhood, of community interaction, and of social cohesion was eliminated. The changing demographics of the project have seen in that in 1954, only 9% of Raymond Rosen's residents were receiving public assistance, and all were functional families, meaning that they consisted of two married adults and their children. Now, 75% of the tenants are receiving public assistance, while many others are receiving other forms of government aid, such as AFDC. Raymond Rosen today possesses all of the problems associated with large urban public housing. 
Four of the eight towers have been vacant for as long as three years because they are unfit for human habitation. The tenants are threatened by crime and drugs. The unemployment rate is 93%. Children learn to drop to the ground at the first sound of gunfire. HUD, recognizing the failure of this type of project, will not allocate money for the total reconstruction of, this to of these towers, but it also will not allow PHA to spend federal dollars to demolish those four vacant towers which stand as silent testimony to failed programs and a changing world. Thus I have learned that correcting mistakes, no matter how serious their consequences, become harder the greater the investment of government money and prestige. Another observation is that public housing and politics are forever joined together and can never be rent asunder. Much of the problem of the Philadelphia Housing Authority's failure rests with successive local administrations which have used the authority for political patronage to the detriment of the tenants. However, even a mayor totally committed to improving public housing, as is our current mayor, Ed Rendell, faces enormous obstacles. All political bureaucracies become self-perpetuating regardless of their effectiveness. Change, no matter how necessary, is difficult to initiate, let alone sustain. For change means a readjustment of power, and that is threatening. I'd like to also mention that in 1991, when I was informed that we were going to receive $84 million from the federal government under HUD, I had said that I didn't believe that we'd be able to spend that $84 million properly, and that if I felt at any time that we were not going to be able to spend that $84 million properly, I would ask for federal intervention. I saw that the changes that had to be made at PHA were generating even stronger local political resistance. And thus, I asked the federal government through the Department of Housing and Urban Development to step in and advance the program of change that I had begun. The lesson here is that change often requires radical and drastic measures. Another lesson I have learned all too painfully is that there is no single solution which will be a panacea for the problems of public housing. Many of our large housing projects have reached the point where their major systems, such as electrical and mechanical, must be entirely replaced if they are to remain habitable. Yet these projects are now seen as causing more problems for the tenants than they solve. Many housing advocates argue that instead of investing in these projects, federal housing dollars should be targeted to increasing the number of scattered site units, which would hopefully integrate PHA tenants into the larger community. Yet this innovative notion is impeded by an increasingly aging housing stock, by the reluctance of tenants to give up their sense of community they now feel in their projects, and by the opposition of existing neighborhoods to an influx of pu public housing tenants. In a similar way, the idea of tenant ownership and management faces many problems. Currently, PHA has one management corporation, with a second corporation to be recognized within six months. We also have 20 developments in the first stage of training for resident management corporations. This will lead to empowerment of the tenants, yet the desires of these tenants will not always be easy to satisfy. Two months ago, I met with the tenant council leadership of the Richard Allen Project. These ladies wanted a set of rules to govern the tenants who live there. I told them that if they wanted rules, they should write them down and PHA would enforce them. I want to give you a copy of their rules and the penalties that they wanted for violation of those rules. Do we have copies? Yeah. You will see that the proposed rules are strict and the penalties are severe. When I asked the PHA legal counsel to review the tenant's proposals, she told me that she doubted whether any housing authority could allow such rules to be propagated, let alone enforced. My experience tells me that public housing tenants want tougher rules and quicker enforcement than housing officials at local or federal levels are currently willing to accept. Thus, two good ideas, relocation of public housing tenants from massive projects into scattered sites and tenant management for housing projects may correct some of our current problems, but they will inexorably produce new problems which must be solved. I wholeheartedly support these new programs, but recognize that they will still have to correct and adjust these solutions. My final observation is that the whole subject of public housing needs to be rethought, and these needs must be done quickly. The condition which gave birth to housing authorities no longer exists. New, more terrible conditions which were not even dreamed of as little as 10 years ago. We need to have everyone impacted by these problems thinking and implementing new ideas. I personally favor programs which will allow current public housing tenants to move out of the projects for homes in the private sector with the government making up the difference between what the tenant can afford and what the home or apartment costs. Such a plan will reduce the administrative cost of public housing and eliminate the social stigma attached to residents of public housing. It also get government out of what should be a private sector business. 
Thus, I believe that even more necessary for HUD to grant housing authorities greater flexibility to experiment with new programs. This means that the rigidity of regulations designed with the best of intentions must be relaxed. Many may say that this will allow corruption and ineptitude to flourish. These problems are inherent in any undertaking designed by man. We cannot, however, allow the lives and futures of so many Americans to be put at risk by our failure to explore new ways to help them. We must constantly encourage and assist all those individuals and agencies which seek to improve public housing. We must hold them to a single, understandable measure of success. A standard is the lives of the tenants are improved by what is done. This is the only standard that counts, for it is the only one which helps people. I thank you for the opportunity for reading that statement into the record. Well, we were pleased to listen to the statement, Mr. Seidel. Let me just say that you barely touched on the subject of this hearing, which is the disgraceful condition of uh, the Public Housing Authority of the City of Philadelphia. It was interesting to hear your philosophical observations. Well, I uh, think but it, allow me to finish I'm my sorry. sentence. But it did not contribute to any extent to our understanding of uh, the disgraceful situation in Philadelphia and the attempts to deal with it. So we will get to that in, in our questions. Mr. Payon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Mr. Chairman, my name is John Payon. I am the Executive Director of the Philadelphia Housing Authority and was appointed to that position in May of 1990. I would, f I would, would like- Would you be so kind and outline for us your previous job history? Yes, um, from 19, um, 72 to 82, I was an employee of the City of Philadelphia in the Office of Housing and Community Development as a civil servant, starting as an administrative intern and leaving as the senior housing manager for the city. Upon leaving, I administered a nonprofit housing development corporation under the Neighborhood Housing Services Program. Uh, I then worked uh, for a bank in Philadelphia as an assistant vice president in charge of um, community operations, con con corporate contributions. Uh, then took a divergent path and, and, and was involved in the development of nursing homes and real estate development and then came on to my current job. And what was your salary in your current job, may I ask? My current job? Yes. The Housing Authority, $99,000 a year. Please go ahead. Surely. I would like to expand on the remarks of Mr. Seidel, the Authority Chairman, in three areas. First, I will describe the financial reforms we have undertaken since my arrival and their impact on the Authority's financial position. Second, I will review some of the procurement changes that have been implemented. Finally, I would like to describe in greater detail our strategy for implementing the one-year plan, which encompasses the complete reorganization of site operations. When I arrived at the Housing Authority, it was in a state of financial collapse. Over a period of many years, no internal capacity to generate year-to-year -year financial reports had existed. The only financial reporting was the external auditor's annual report, which was available only six months or more after the end of the fiscal year, which is in March, of March 31st. For the year prior to my arrival, the authority's internal records required adjustments of tens of millions of dollars in order for the annual audit to be completed. This lack of internal data assured mismanagement of resources as there were no internal reports and managers had no way to evaluate the, the authority's financial operations on a month-to-month -month basis. This situation was mirrored in the authority's dire financial situation. In the fiscal year ending March 1989, the operating deficit was over $7 million. While some improvements were registered in the year ending March 1990 when the deficit was $5.4 million, the authority's overall financial position was still deteriorating. Turning this around became the top priority in my first year in office. We initiated internal financial controls, enhanced the accounting system, and by the end of 1990 we were generating monthly financial reports. These allowed us to move, move closely, more closely manage the day-to-day -day operations, which we are also undergoing some review and streamlining, so that our financial position improved appreciably by the end of my first year. After only one year, we had op an operating surplus of over $1 million compared to the previous year's loss of $5.4 million. Can I'm you tell us how you achieved this uh, apparent that, that $6.5 million dollar turnaround? Okay. That was achieved by a early retirement program in which we uh, encouraged a number of employees to 
How much of the six and a half million was due to the early uh, retirement program? I would say uh, probably about half of that. Half of that. About half of that. <laughs> Which uh, placed uh, then a heavier burden on your retirement fund, didn't it? Yes, sir. Our, our retirement so this is not really a matter of operating efficiencies, but this is a matter of dumping some employees onto no, the retirement. No, I, I, I don't think so because. Well, I think you just testified to that. That we, as one of the strategies in order to deal with the deficit. And any I'm not questioning the wisdom of the strategy. As a professional economist, I would like to identify what accounts for the $6.4 million turnabout. Approximately half and you that, just sir. testified a moment ago that about half of that was the result of encouraging an early retirement program, yes, correct, which meant that of the $6.4 million turnabout, about $3.2 million was the result of getting people off your current payroll and putting them on your retirement fund. Is that correct? That, is, that would be a correct assumption. Analysis. Okay, now what about the other half? The, the rest of it came through operating um, uh, ex, ex, uh, efficiencies. Uh, well, every, give, give us. Everything from instead of an employee changing a flat tire, which required four, four hours of overtime, we contracted with AAA for $27 a year for each car and AAA changed the tire. Um, those, uh, a, whole, a, now, a whole series of those efficiencies. I also have, if I may. An, an well, how many, ov how many tires were changed well, at I mean, the I'm rate <laughs> of $4, uh, four hours I, I'm of giving, overtime? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just giving you one, one well, example. Well, I'd like some more meaningful examples that I can grasp. Okay. Um, we are looking we, at $3.2 million. We, dollars. Cut, we cut down significantly in overtime. Our overtime budget was approximately $1.5 million. Uh, we reduced that to about $800,000. All right. Um, uh, we uh, now we cut, are now we are okay, down we to cut two and down a half number. Uh, previously, one of the ways in which we one of the ways in which we um, dealt with maintenance was through a system of contract maintenance, in which we went out into the open market on competitive bid to bring contractors in from the outside to do maintenance on housing authority properties. Uh, we you found, found that to be more cost effective. Yes, well, we found that to be ineffective because the quality of the contractors that were hired to do the work had a lot to be desired. At least in, in the first year that I was there, I found that to be true. At, at that time, I decided to go with more in-house training and try to get the people who are currently on the Housing Authority's maintenance staff to perform the majority of those repairs because they could be done in an instantaneous fashion as opposed to going out to an open competitive bid which may take anywhere on an emergency basis 48 hours to 30 days on an open competitive bid. We saved probably two two million dollars uh, there alone. Mr. Payon, you say that uh after only one year, you had an operating surplus of a million dollars. Correct. Um, in the year ending March 92, uh -huh. you have an, an operating surplus of two and a half million dollars, and you project a balanced budget for 93. Uh -huh. Distinguish between a balanced budget and an operating budget. Well, uh, I'm sorry. The the operating. Well, in the same paragraph, you are telling us that last year you had a million dollar surplus. Yes, sir. The, in the fiscal year just ended, you had a two and a half million dollar surplus. Mm -hmm. And then you conclude the paragraph by saying a balanced budget is projected to fiscal year '93. That's correct, sir. The, the budget, the operating budget, would be approximately $150 million, and we project that we would have that. What we have done with the surplus, we are, I'll give you one example, we are self-insured. And one of the findings is that there is not enough money in the self-insurance program to cover our self-insurance. We were taking that surplus and putting it in the self-insurance program to meet one of the, the problems of, the, the, of a former HUD audit. I still point. don't understand how with continuing improvement, you hope to get yes. a balanced can, can budget I, when you are showing surpluses okay. for the last two years. Can I ask Mr. Roch, the financial director, to join me at the table, if I may, Yes, sir? you may. Thank you. Mr. Roch? Do you want to respond to that? You I will have to swear you in. <coughs> you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to <coughs> offer is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. So help you. <coughs> I do. Please.
Go ahead. Uh, could you repeat the question, uh, Mr. Antos? Yes. Turn to <coughs> page two of Mr. Peon's testimony, top paragraph. I'm going to read it in its entirety. After only one year, we had an operating surplus of over $1 million compared to the previous year's loss of over $5.4 million. I'm happy to report that this year, ending in March 92, we have at least a $2.5 million operating surplus. A balanced budget is projected for fiscal year 93. Explain that to me. I mean, last <coughs> year, you had an operating surplus of a million. In the year just ended, you had an operating surplus of two and a half million. And the continuing improvement will next year take you to a balanced well, budget. <coughs> the improvement uh, comes from the turnaround from 1990 to 1991, and then again in 1992. I understand in, that. I, and in 1992, uh, we just finished the, uh, the year and we had a, uh, an operating surplus of two million five. That's correct. We had. Uh, we had revenues okay. of 101 million in expenditures. Now, why are you dropping back? Well, because in we are increasing. In, in the following year, we are increasing our, our, our expenditures uh, in the areas of uh, maintenance and also salary increases. So that uh, we are. So instead of running a surplus, you're going to spend. Yes, we're going to okay. we're going to spend what That's we take in. Okay, go ahead. My apologies for making that clear, sir. <coughs> If I may, at the same time, we have increased the, r the rate of rent collection of current rent due from 70% to 80%. We have improved rent receivables back the backlog from 9 million as of March 1990 March 1990 to 7.2 million at the end of March 1991 and 4.8 million as of March 31st. This is due to a combination of improved rent collection as well as writing off more of uh, these uncollectible debts. How much of that was improved collection and how much of it was we, just writing We wrote off, off this year $2.5 million. Last year, Ed, I believe, was $1 million. Uh, in 1991, it was 2.5, and in 1992, it was 2.75. Uh, the well, the majority let me, let of the me just stop you there for a minute. In March 1990, in March 1990 you had a receivables backlog of 7.2 million. Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Yes. And how much did you write off in the last two years? Uh, Combined? Uh, 5 million 250. 5 million 250. Well, far from an improvement, you have a deteriorating situation. It's very easy to show uh, increase rent collections if you write off your receivables. Well, am I correct or am uh, I wrong? If, if I can respond to that, uh, uh, the, the actual collection process of receivables is improving. However, it still isn't sufficient to prevent the growth in receivables. And what we've done is that to improve the uh, uh, the balance sheet is, is to write off receivables on vacated tenants, which are clearly had uncollectible. You not, had, you not ch had you not written off receivables, which you don't think you can collect, the picture would have moved up from 7.2 million. Correct. So the testimony is misleading. Not it's, in the well, it's palpably misleading. You are patting yourself, uh, you are patting yourself on the shoulder saying that um, Rent receivables backlog went down from 7.2 million f to 4.8 million, but it went down because you wrote off 5.2 million dollars. I mean, you are free to testify to this effect, but you are not free to praise yourself for this. Okay. Am I clear? Yes, you are, sir. Okay. I'm very disappointed to see this bit of testimony because it, uh, it uh, very severely um, undermines my confidence in other statements as well. Please go ahead. Okay. I will continue with the prepared testimony then. Because of the decreasing operating reserves and increasing tenant receivables from 1988 through fiscal 19... I really don't want you to read the whole thing. If you okay. can summarize it, I'd be grateful. Okay. Ed, would you want to... Uh, would would I'd would, ask Mr. Mr. Roch to summarize mm. it. I'm sorry. Would you summarize the, the testimony, Ed? Mr. Chairman, if you 
going to summarize his own testimony, I think that's one thing. But if he's going to summarize Mr. Payone's testimony, I think that's something well, else. Mr. Mr. Raj, help me prepare the testimony. Well, I'd appreciate hearing from you directly. You're the okay. executive director. Uh, be gladly, sir. I was just trying to be more accurate. If there's a question that uh, is raised, we can certainly uh, okay. get clarification. Again, we. Uh, Liquid operating reserves uh, were 4 percent of the maximum reserves in 1931 versus uh, 19 percent in two years later, an improvement of 375 percent. Basically what I'm trying to say here is when I took over the authority, the first problem that, was, that I confronted and was confronted by staff was we are in a terrible financial situation. This situation had been brewing for a number of years. And the first actions that I had to take as executive director were to stabilize the financial condition of the housing authority, to get my financial house in order first, at the same time deal with enormous amount of other problems that presented itself. What I was trying to do here is, quite frankly, just tell you the situation as I saw it in May of 1990 and the actions that were taken to do that. Yes. I believe that we have made progress financially over this. And Mr. Chairman, I, 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 I respect your comments, but I was not trying to patronize myself or pat myself on the back. I was trying to say the difficult situ situation at the Housing Authority and both myself and Mr. Seidel found ourselves in 19... No one questions the fact, Mr. Peon, that you found a disgraceful situation when you came in. I resent the fact that your testimony portrays a claimed improvement when in point of fact there was no improvement whatsoever. You just wrote off bad debts that you decided you're not going to collect. Well, the Therefore, the outstanding bad debt declined. I mean, that's self-evident. Self-evident. That's self-evident self and it would have been honest had it been so presented. It was presented as an achievement, mm -hmm. and it was nothing of the sort. It was yeah. nothing of the, f of the sort. Okay. You have, had you maintained on your books the rents that were owed the housing authority and not paid, not collected, you would have shown an increase from the 7.2 million, mm -hmm. not a decrease. Okay. And since one needs an IQ of 75 to see through this, I resent the presentation, because it's a, it's a misleading presentation. It's a phony presentation. Not, not meant to be so. My apologies. If I, I, I am happy to hear you say that. Thank but, you, sir. Uh, that does not change the fact. Okay. Go I ahead. Would, I would then like to proceed to item number two in the area of procurement, which is the, the final paragraph on that uh, page two. In the area of procurement, we had two main problems. One was systematic coordination and record keeping of supplies, materials, and physical assets were non-existent. When I arrived, plans had been initiated for a central warehouse. A central warehouse had been purchased and set up. This facility was completed in early 1990. We inaugurated a much stronger system of controls and with computerized material distribution, we now have an online real-time system. We inaugurated experienced staff training to assure s the system's effective implementation and that all federal, state, and, and authority policy is followed. Well, let me stop you here. <coughs> you, you heard the previous testimony yes, sir. concerning the alleged conflict of interest, the purchase from yes, sir, a store which I take it is owned by a member of your family? Yes, sir. And run by your son, managed no, by your... No, not my son, sir. Second, not, not your second son. Cousin. cousin, nephew? Second cousin. Okay. Can you comment on yes, that, Yes, I would please? like very much to comment on that. Um, first, it should be mentioned that Mr. Feldman, the gentleman who presented that, is in current litigation with the Housing Authority. And that I believe that that, that presentation is tainted by the fact that he is, again, in litigation with the Housing Authority and that a number of attempts have been made to to uh, settle the suit between the various uh, lawyers for the Housing Authority and his attorney. The information presented throughout his statement and particularly... I'm just asking about it, this. It, it, is a full, it, is, it is not correct, sir. It is not okay, correct. I have a legal opinion from the General Counsel saying... No, no, is, I'm asking you. It is not correct, sir. My, my cousin does own the store, yes, sir. And, and purchases were made at the store? Yes, sir. And these purchases moved up from... Fifteen hundred dollars to some I, I, seventy-two. I believe that figure may be correct, sir. Yes. They were purchased through an open competitive system of of bids. Um, 
approved by the director of procurement. Um, I became aware that the individual who was my relative was doing business with the housing authority uh, about a year after I was there. The individual did business with the housing authority through a, through a buyer, one of five buyers who works for the housing authority. She had a previous relationship with them when she was somewhere else. She brought them over. There is no, there is no involvement on my end. I signed no orders. I signed no procurement orders, no purchase orders, etc. When I found out about it, I asked if it was proper and legal. I was told it was yes. I asked the general counsel if for a legal opinion. She said there was no conflict. I have maintained my distance. It is an arm's length transaction. I do not see myself in the, in the position of going to a second cousin who is a distant relative and saying, because you happen to have the last name, as I do, you cannot uh, do work for the housing authority. I agree. It, look, it is it is embarrassing. It's embarrassing to me. It's embarrassing to my family. It's embarrassing to my to my my second cousin who I see at Christmas time, uh, and there's no further relationship other than that. And I think it's unfortunate that it was brought up here because it, it, it's being used as an attempt to uh, embarrass me with regard to an ongoing legal suit. Who is suing whom? Uh, Mr. Feldman is suing the housing authority because of his of his layoff. When was he laid off? In May of 1990. I'm sorry. 90, May 1991, I'm sorry. In May of 1991, by whom? By the Housing Authority, myself as Executive Director. And why? Um, may I state that, again, it's in litigation, I feel, I, I don't want to try it here. Forgive I don't wish to try it here, okay. but it is the function of this subcommittee to look into the mess at the Philadelphia Public Housing Authority. And if an internal auditor is fired, Mr. Mr. after, allow me to finish sure. my sentence. And if an internal auditor is fired, after he raises questions with respect to potential conflicts of interest involving the head of the housing authority, it is appropriate to inquire of the head of the housing authority why this internal auditor was fired. Okay. Mr. Feldman was laid off due to reorganization. He, there was no knowledge on my part or anyone else that there was a conflict of interest that never entered into the picture. He never approached me with it. Only recently did an article appear in a Philadelphia newspaper, which was maybe even leaked to that newspaper by someone, that uh, there, there was a business relationship between a second cousin and myself. The apparent or alleged conflict of interest has n had no bearing on Mr. Feldman's employment. When he was laid off, how many other people were laid off? There was a series of people that laid, they were laid off in, or terminated, or in some instances fired for cause uh, over the one year period that I had been there. No one was laid off the same exact day that he was. How many individuals at his level were terminated? There, there, up until that time, there was probably... No, in, in, in that time frame, yes. Up until that time, about a half a dozen. For budgetary reasons? Not necessarily. One, some others were laid off because, or fired, or terminated because of uh, improprieties. Mm -hmm. What was the reason in Ms. Feldman's case? It was due to a reorganization. A reorganization? Yes, sir. Describe the reorganization. The reorganization, and again, I'm, I'm limited and, and I'm a little uncomfortable. In well, this, the I, I matter of reorganization I will do is a matter best. of public record. I will do my best here. It was determined to reorganize, reorganize the internal audit unit so that it uh, provided a function uh, similar to a inspector general type function uh, with an individual who is a uh, internal audit manager as opposed to a director of internal audit in which the position was more responsible to, or responsive both to the board and the executive director. Do I understand you that another internal auditor was hired? No, when was, he someone was, was promoted from within, from the internal audit. How many internal auditors did the authority have? Three or four. Four. Yes, How sir. many does it, did it have after the firing or the layoff? Well, there, there, was, um, there was four, Mr. Feldman, uh, there are four now, so that uh, one of his associates... I failed to see the reorganization or the change in staffing, so explain it to me so I understand it. When Mr. Feldman was laid off, one of his... What reason was given for his being terminated? He was laid off due to the reorganization. 
reorganization yes, and what was the nature of the reorganization? The reorganization had to do with reorganizing the entire internal audit department which consisted of approximately four people. At what, the time, what was his uh, uh, status in the hierarchy? Was he, he number was a, one, no, number he, two, number three, number four? He was four? a senior staff member and he was in charge of the internal audit department. He was the head of the internal audit That's department. Correct. And after the what you call reorganization the three people who worked for him remained. Correct. And a new person was brought in? Uh, uh, not in his position, in a lower level position, yes. And one of the three people uh, was elevated? Yes, the, 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 the person who eventually was brought on was not brought on immediately, but was brought on approximately How long three, had Mr. Later. Feldman worked uh, for the housing authority? I believe he was there from, and I stand to be corrected, 1982, I believe, but not in that position. On, from 82 to 91? I believe so. And what were his performance uh, reviews? I'm, I, don't, I don't remember offhand. I was there only for one year when he was there. Uh -huh. uh, Ms. Feldman, will you join us at the table? You have already been sworn in, so I will not swear in again. What, was your perf what were your performance reviews during the 10 years you worked for the Philadelphia Housing Authority? Most of them were superior, and I believe one was satisfactory. Mm -hmm. What is the, the rating scale? Superior is the best? or I believe uh, outstanding is the outstanding, best. Outstanding, superior, satisfactory. Right. And unsatisfactory. Improvement needed and then, uh, and then unsatisfactory. unsatisfactory. So there are five grades. Correct. And these were annual reviews? Yes, they were. And you're suggesting that most of yours were of the second highest rating? Right, and on one occasion the highest and rating. And on one occasion of the highest rating and one occasion satisfactory. satisfactory. Is it your view that you were terminated because of reorganization, or is it your view that you were terminated because uh, you were blowing the whistle? I was terminated for blowing the whistle. I told the truth and I paid the price for it. Any comment, Mr. Chairman? Uh, in just a minute, you'll have every, every chance uh, to uh, describe the circumstances of your termination. Do I understand that uh, you were removed from the facility by police? That's correct. On the day of my termination, May 3rd, 1991, I was prepared to release my human resources audit report, which actually mirrored much of what the uh, later HUD report reflected uh, in this current year. and. Two police officers came to my office after I had met with uh, Mr. Payone and they were to escort me from the building to take my personal belongings and to leave immediately. Were you displaying a degree of physical violence? No. Did you threaten anyone? No. Would you have left without police escort had you been asked to leave? Yes, I would. Subcommittee will be in recess. They will resume. You were going to say, say something, Mr. Pian. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not prepared to continue. Um, I'd be grateful if you'd pull the mic. I'm sorry, sir. Sure. Um, I, don't, I don't have a one-for-one one retort to Mr. Feldman's uh, discussions. Again, the matter is under litigation. I prefer that, that you know, I deal with it through a litigation process, sir. That's fine with me. Thank you.
The, go ahead. Do you, I have, uh, should I continue with the prepared Please testimony? Please continue, yes. Thank you. The, the final aspect of the prepared testimony is the adoption and creation of a one-year plan at the Philadelphia Housing Authority. The, the, the emphasis of the one-year plan is to identify and correct major deficiencies in management, maintenance, and capital improvements. This plan was adopted by, uh, put together by staff and recently adopted by the board approximately uh, three weeks ago. It deals primarily with uh, setting up targets, focusing on the most serious deficiencies preventing us from meeting HUD standards. Um, number one, a backlog reduction maintenance improvements. To eliminate repair maintenance backlog of 1,212 units through special apartment renovation teams and private renovation crews. To reduce the number of vacant units needing substantial repair by 172 units. To reduce the average time to re-rent uh, normal vacancy to 30 days. And I'll try to summarize this and be brief. To respond to emergency repair requests within 24 hours. To achieve 2% or less vacancy rates in the occupied developments that do not need substantial renovations, to present a plan in 90 days regarding distressed uh, D-level scattered site housing rehabilitation and management. D-level is the worst level of scattered sites within the scattered site environment in the city. Uh, capital project streamlining to reflect private construction management practices for better project control and efficiency through new pro project management system to increase the rate of obligation of federal modernizations funds by 100% by obligating at least $40 million towards approved project activity to improve the rate by which HUD reviews and approves requests for improved communication uh, by commu improved communication and attention to HUD concerns. Reorganization to achieve a higher per performance standard, streamline central management to imp implement site-based management including budget control and accountability encompassing all functions at the conventional site level to create new job descriptions within 90 days to evaluate and replace people who do not meet performance standards within 180 days to create internal controls and hire an inspector general within 120 days. Um, I personally remain committed to continuing the process of improvement at the Housing Authority, a process that has been difficult but has taken place. And I thank you for the opportunity to present this presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierre. Let me just wrap up uh, the aspects of uh, um, Mr. Feldman's termination, which do not have uh, uh, ramifications with respect to your lawsuit. Uh, was he paid by federal funds? Yes, he was. You know, this committee has jurisdiction over federal employees, uh, so I have great interest in, in uh, sure. uh, problems of uh, federal whistleblowers, mm -hmm. and we have had uh, number, numbers of hearings on this, and may in fact have to have a hearing on this issue. Um, were you his superior at the time he was terminated? Yes, I was. Did you order his removal by police? No, I did not. Who did? No. The, again, the instance as it occurred, uh, the Philadelphia Housing Authority has its own police force, a housing, housing police force. And what uh, I had asked one of the officers to do was to keep an eye and make sure he took no, pers no authority documents. He was the internal auditor. He had access to what could be considered sensitive documents. That would be, uh, it was more of a standard operating procedure and precaution than anything else. So there, was, there, there were not police officers with guns or anything else there. I mean, it was just a standard operating procedure. You mean when you terminate an employee, you have the no, police? No. Let me finish, please. We are very much concerned on this committee with the dignity of every individual. Surely. who works for the federal government or who is paid with federal funds. Was there any indication during the course of uh, Mr. Feldman's uh, uh, employ with the Philadelphia Housing Authority that he was removing documents uh, that belong properly to the authority? I don't know if I can comment on that, sir. Well, I'm asking you uh, to there comment is, on that. There is a series of ongoing federal investigations, and um, I don't know if I would, by commenting on that, violate any laws of secrecy that I've been asked to uphold. Well, let me rephrase my question. You had reasonable doubt to assume that he might remove documents 
And that is why the involvement of police was called by you? No, I, again, the, the, the reason I asked a detective to go down there was this to make sure that he removed the items that belonged to him in an orderly fashion. Well, you're dealing with a 10-year professional employee. Is that correct? I believe he was there for 10 years, yes. Yeah, and he was a professional employee involved with uh, serious and confidential matters as the head of the internal audit unit. Is that correct? Correct. This was a position of trust, would you agree? It was a position of, of importance and, and a professional position. Um, it could be construed as a position of trust. I, well, I, the Philadelphia Housing Authority is comparable to a, a business with a hundred, about a hundred and fifty million dollar budget. Is that correct? Correct. Now, if I appoint you as head of the internal audit unit of that hundred and fifty million dollar corporation with seventeen hundred employees, some twenty, how many thousands of housing units? Approximately 23,000. 23,000 housing units. I would consider your position to be a position of trust. I, I, I did not appoint Mr. Feldman. He no, was, no, but I mean, if were I to do that, he was appointed to that position. By a previous executive director, correct. By a previous executive director. So he was holding a position of trust. You can say that, yes. Under those circumstances, I think you'd have to explain to me one more time why the involvement of police is necessary well, during the, the time of his termination. When someone is laid off, you never know what the reaction of that individual may be. You can take it very quietly or you can get very angry. And I've in, not at the house. During well, those 10 years, to the best of your knowledge, has he threatened fellow employees? I'm not aware that he has. Well, let me ask you, Mr. Feldman, during the 10 years that you worked for the Philadelphia Housing Authority, did you physically threaten any of your fellow workers? No, never. Go ahead, Mr. Payon. I've concluded my testimony, sir. Uh, That's the, right, and I'm asking you questions. Did, okay. uh, yes. When did you become uh, head of the Housing Authority? May 3rd, 1990. May 3rd, 1990. Um, on April 3, 1990, one month before you're becoming uh, head, the Philadelphia Housing Authority entered into a consulting agreement with the former executive director. Are you aware of that? Yes, concept? I am, sir. This agreement uh, paid him effectively $1,951 an hour for consulting services. Are you aware of this I'm level aware of, of compensation? From, I'm, aware of it from I'm, the I'm aware of it from the audit. Yes, sir. I was aware that he had a contract also. Um, when did you, Mr. Seidel, become um, um, chairman of the board? I believe, Mr. Chairman, it was February or March of 19, uh, 1990. February or March of 1990. That's correct. Uh, as chairman, were you aware of this consulting agreement with the former executive director? One of the provisions uh, that was negotiated by his counsel and counsel to the authority um, was a separation agreement upon which Mr. Kern uh, would be involved in a consulting arrangement so that there would be, during an interim period, there would be um, the ability for the new executive director to familiarize himself with the operations of the housing authority. That is correct. So would you answer the question, were you aware of this agreement? I was aware of an agreement between Mr. Kern and the housing authority as to uh, the, his separation, yes. As chairman, did you have to approve of that agreement? The entire board, if I'm not mistaken, 
Mr. Chairman, uh, approve the agreement. Were you a member of that board? Yes, I was. To the best of your knowledge, was there a vote with respect to this agreement? Yes, there was. I believe the vote was uh, unanimous, 5 nothing. So you voted for it? I voted for it because at that time we felt that collectively, all of us, uh, that it was important that there be a transitional period upon which Mr. Kern would, uh, would remain on board in a consulting arrangement, yes. When you voted for this agreement, were you aware of the fact that it provided for an effective hourly rate of $1,951? No. Uh, I don't remember offhand, Mr. Chairman, how, how the contract was worded. Um, it was my understanding, and uh, if I remember correctly from circumstances two years ago, that uh, we could use Mr. Kern uh, based upon his agreement with us uh, as much as was necessary during his interim time frame. So I don't know where the, the hourly number comes from. I will read it to you. This is finding number eight of the Inspector General's report. I'm quoting. Let's supply a copy to the recorder to subscribe. <coughs> Conflict of interest consulting contracts. On April 30, 1990, the Philadelphia Housing Authority entered into a consulting agreement with the former executive director who resigned on May 2, 1990. The former executive director was to be available for one hour a week, one hour a week, not as much time as was required, Mr. Seidel, one hour a week, to assist the Philadelphia Housing Authority. PHA paid $40,976 or $1,951 an hour for that consulting service over a five month period and that's September 27, 1990. Now that I've refreshed your memory, do the details of the agreement come back to you? No, they don't. Um, they don't. They don't, but I, I will assume, of course, that that is an accurate information. It is it an accurate bit of information. What is your comment about the rate of pay? Well, I think the rate of pay is exorbitant uh, based upon what you had just presented to me. Why did you vote for it, Mr. Saido? As I, as I mentioned before, Mr. Chairman, it was my understanding that uh, Mr. Kern would be available for as much needed time as necessary uh, during a time frame between his moving out as executive director and moving in uh, a new executive director. Did you read the contract? I don't remember what happened two years ago. I, I wish I did, but uh, I don't well, remember. Well, you claim to rem remember that he would be available for as much time I as remember necessary. I remember that in, the, in conversation, yes. conversation outside of the regular board meeting at which this was approved or as part of the official presentation of the contract? I am not trying to be evasive, but I don't remember that one way or the other. Do you feel you should have read the contract before you voted for it? It was our belief because it was a collective decision um, that what was being done on the but best But each interest. individual had his or her own vote. So let's leave the collective decision out of it. Everybody, you could have voted against it. I mean, the vote you tell me was five to zero. It could have been three to two or four to one. Couldn't have been. So I am merely holding res you responsible for your own vote. And it was my decision at that time to vote in favor of the contract because I felt that the removal of Mr. Kern was in the best interest of the Housing Authority at that time. Why? Because as I, as I believe 26 months later um, that there has been a series of problems at the Housing Authority and I felt at that time that there was a need for a change at the top and hopeful that that would lead uh, to changes in middle management and then move forward in a comprehensive fashion to be accountable uh, to the tenants of the Housing Authority. Your, your assumption therefore is that Mr. Curran, is that the gentleman's name? Yes. Mr. Curran did not shine as a director. His performance was not outstanding. No, it was That's why I you vote. Uh, sorry? Yes, that's true. How would you characterize the quality of his performance? I would characterize the quality of his performance based on the product of what I saw when I ran for office as city controller of Philadelphia as being deplorable. Poor? Yes. Deplorable, he said. 
well, if somebody's performance is deplorable, why do you give him a contract that pays him $1,951 an hour? Again, I can only reiterate what is my recollection from past events, and that was that I do believe that Mr. Kern spent certainly more than one hour a week, or I don't have a copy of the contract in front of me. Whatever that was, I know he spent more than one hour there uh, to help us during a transitional time. But the time. contract called only for one hour availability. I think the contract, uh, looking back now, I think that, that was, if that is the contract that was voted on, then I believe that that was incorrect and, and should not have been done. But it was my belief at that time that it was in the best interest for the tenants of the Housing Authority that Mr. Kern be removed, uh, that he move on, and that during the transitional phase that he be available to help us uh, in it, so it would be an orderly transition. A cynic might say that this was a payoff for him to leave. A cynic might say that. You don't think the cynic would be correct in saying that? No, I think that the responsibility um, rests with what at that time was in the best interest of those people that you're trying to help. And I, again, I can only reiterate that at that time I felt that the removal of Mr. Kern was in the best interest of the tenants of the Housing Authority. And Could he and have been terminated without this contract? I don't believe that he was under contract at that time, and therefore wh whatever the policy, employment policy was at that time, he could have been terminated, yes. So this was a voluntary action by the board. It's um, my understanding that it does state one hour, but there is a, there is a section which states that, uh, that he would be available at other times given sufficient notice. Because I do, want, I do remember being, meeting with Mr. Kern several times during that time frame that was certainly beyond one hour per week. May I ask you if you were involved with the termination of Mr. Uh, Feldman? No, I wasn't. Were you aware of it? I was aware of it when Mr. Um, Mr. Payon brought it to my attention. Prior to the fact or subsequent to it? Um, that he, that, no, Mr. Payone had stated to me that he was uh, uh, contemplating the dismissal or method of reorganization uh, of the internal uh, division. And, uh, and I said, it, again, I never dealt with the individual day-to-day -day operations of the Housing Authority. But it is my belief as the controller of Philadelphia that what was necessary at PHA was that we create an Office of Inspector General which would have a three-year contract and report directly to the Board of Commissioners, and that is part of the one-year plan, which was begun uh, to be formulated about, four, about uh, nine months ago. Uh, Mr. Seidel, you clearly knew that the Philadelphia Housing Authority was in a tremendous financial and organizational and management chaos. Yes. Uh, under those circumstances, one would think that an, in, an internal audit unit assumes extraordinary importance. Yes, assuming that I, had, uh, that I believed that the individual as the director was a trusted employee. At that time and before, a number of months before that, I began my own investigation as the controller and sent my own team of people in uh, because, it, quite frankly, it was difficult for me to trust uh, what information was being supplied to me uh, by the internal workings of the authority. By the director or by the internal audit Just unit? by general information. I wanted to make sure that the people that were supplying me information that I knew were completely without agenda. And the only people that I knew that were completely without agenda were the civil servants that worked for me as the control of the city of Philadelphia. And I had sent them in in the early part of 1991 uh, to do an independent investigation on my behalf. Mr. Payon, how, how long did you serve as executive director from when to when? May, uh, April 3? I'm sorry, May 3rd. I'm sorry, 19, May 3. 1990 to present. May 3, 1990 to the present. Correct, sir. <coughs> now, you are aware of the fact that the Inspector General claims that during the period of your service, HUD subsidies were provided for housing units that had been demolished earlier. 
We're, we're talking about the 495 houses that was Correct. mentioned earlier, and that is an audit finding. Yes. yes. What is your comment on okay. that, sir? That's not absolutely correct, sir. Um, Please correct it. Um, when I came on board in May of 1990, I became aware later, well, probably six or seven months, among all the other issues that I dealt with yeah. about the problem with regard to uh, the subsidy involved for houses that were demolished. And for background purposes only, the Housing Authority does not demolish houses. It, do it doesn't have money to do that and it's not permitted by HUD to do that. The local code enforcement agency known as licenses and inspections will usually demolish a house in Philadelphia because it is eminently dangerous or that the house next to it fell down. There's, there's a, v a valid reason. Is there any communication between the yes, two when, agencies? When, when LNI does that, it usually, usually does that on an emergency basis and then notifies the housing authority afterward that has demolished the house. There is no eminent domain involved. The, house, the code enforcement agency has the local power to do okay. that without uh, eminent okay. domain. A, and this is historical. A, a notice is usually sent, and from what I understand previously, the notice would be sent to the various field offices of the housing authority. And again, the houses we're talking about are scattered sites. They're not conventional sites. Yes. And that field office is then forwarded to the central office. The central office would then record it and send a notice to the Department of HUD in Philadelphia, the regional office in Philadelphia. And that, assume, based on that notice, then HUD would amend the ACC, the annual contributions contract, to reflect that one unit. How many now, budgets did you sign? I've signed two since I've been there, sir. You have signed two. That's correct. And uh, now that the Inspector General's audit is out, do you think that uh, what you testify to by signing that budget needs revision? No, if, with regard to those houses? Yes. In May of 1991, we sent a letter to the director, area director of, of housing at, at HUD informing the area director that there were 495 houses that had been demolished in Philadelphia by the local code enforcement agency, which had not been subtracted from the annual contributions contract. At that period of time, uh, I believe in, in, in that budget, we sub 208 of those were subtracted then by the, the, the HUD people, and the remaining ones, 287, were subtracted in the last budget. It is somewhat misleading when you hear the testimony that we did not take any action whatsoever. We did. We did the survey. We found the 495 houses. The number came from the housing authority to HUD. And I'd like to submit, uh, as with regard to my testimony, our response to the HUD audit, which is 107 pages. In that response, you will see the, the, the graph that shows the, uh, the 395 houses, some of which go back to 1972, two d 20, 20 years ago. Now, the other thing you must remember is that in addition to that, there were additional houses that were demolished over and above the 495 that over a period of time, the 20-year period, were sent to HUD. HUD did subtract them from the annual contributions contract and made the subtraction, the valid subtraction. So the 495 is, is not an inclusive number. It's the number that was not uh, that HUD did not pick up or, or maybe in some circumstances we may not have uh, notified them appropriately. The Inspector General's report claims that on the average it takes about four years to have a unit uh, repaired. I Is would, that accurate? Uh, it, the Inspector General's report says four years to have it occupied. Not, not repaired, okay? Okay. And I would disagree with that because what they have done... What is the correct figure? It's probably about three to four months. And let me, let me explain how I come to that. What they have done is taken the length of a unit that is vacant because of planned modernization, uh, either um, under MROP or CAP, which in some instances may be years, and then taken and averaged that out with a unit that recently becomes vacant. And you get that... that but effectively, the unit is not used for four years. Not each and every unit, but... Well, they, are, they say are. on the average. I, we, again, we, that's, they, they are, they, what they've done, there are, of the 4,600 vacant units in Philadelphia, approximately, Do approximately, you think that the IG of HUD is biased against the Philadelphia I, I don't, Housing No, I don't, don't want to say that. I'm just saying... Well, why don't they say one year, if it's one year? Why do they say four years? Well, we met with them in the exit interview, and we, pro we gave them our response to what they found, and they, disag they disagreed with it. So I'm, I'm just trying to... But, of course, I disagree with your response, too, because it makes no sense. What your response says is that 
the unit may be vacant for three and a half years and then it may take six months to fix it. So you should consider the, the fixing time six months. And they say, no, it's four years because for three and a half years but, you didn't touch it. But if you and then you start the fixing it. Okay. If you subtract the units that are vacant because of long-term plan modernization, you subtract them out of the equation. But you they, shouldn't subtract well, them out of the equation. Well, Why you, should you? You have to because they're, they're vacant with HUD's approval and with the Housing Authority's approval, waiting, either waiting funding or a funding source, or they're, or they're under rehabilitation. If you remove those from the equation and you look at all the other units that become vacant because of n normal turnover, then it takes about four months to repair and occupy the unit, assuming it's not catastrophic, like a fire or something like that. You failed to persuade me, Mr. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm I, giving I think you the Inspector General's judgment is, uh, is, uh, is the judgment but, that right. people with... Uh, common sense would, uh, would agree with. Um, you're spending about six million dollars on security, is that correct? That is correct, sir. Am I accurate in understanding that your security people stay in a booth and they see a cr crime being committed, they call Philadelphia police? O only partially. Uh, the Philadelphia Housing Authority has a uh, professional police force that is equal in authority to the Philadelphia police, with the exception we can only arrest people on, on our own grounds. Yes. Uh, a number of years ago, we instituted something called Operation Secure in the high rises, in which we put a secure booth to, in the entrance of the high rises in an attempt to control the people, the undesirables are people who do not live in that development from gaining access yes. to the development. As part of that, an armed police officer stays in that booth and admits people in. The, their instructions are if they see an altercation, they are immediately to call either the housing police for assistance or the Philadelphia police. If they leave the booth unattended, then the people will gain entrance to the high rise. This is standard operating procedure in yes, other sir. housing authorities. Um, I cannot. I cannot speak for other housing. I, I do not believe many, there are not a significant number of housing authorities that have their own police force. Mm -hmm. Who initiated the takeover of uh, the Philadelphia Public Housing Authority? That I believe was initiated by Mr. Seidel. I initiated that, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you think that uh, HUD was uh, going to do it anyway, or do you feel that this was <coughs> a, a, an initiative which uh, grew out entirely uh, from your own judgment that it had to be taken over by HUD? I believe it had to be taken over, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Housing Authority has been existing, <coughs> as I said, since 1937. Right. Uh, it is a deplorable situation in the city of Philadelphia. It is. Uh, ridden with many employees which have received their employment through less than professional means. Uh, at the present time we have a one-year plan which I think sets guideposts up uh, as to what can be done in relationship to maintenance and design and construction. We then uh, signed about a week and a half ago an agreement with the Building Trades Council of the City of Philadelphia to provide uh, carpenters which can do carpentry work, electricians that can do electrical work, uh, glaziers that can do glazier work, and roofers that can do roofers work and, and, and so on. I believe that that present time that the political <coughs> pressures that are at bear at the Philadelphia Housing Authority would uh, in some way compromise the one-year plan and compromise what I think is, is a beginning of a slow movement in the proper direction. And I asked HUD to step in uh, as an outside force to make sure that those people uh, that were going to be fired were fired based upon their professional responsibility and those people that were to be hired would be hired based upon their own professional responsibility. And I felt that HUD, as an outside force from the political environment of Philadelphia, could do a better job than the current internal workings of the Housing Authority. Mr. Seidel, <coughs> please correct me if I'm wrong, but we have received information indicating that your fellow board members were about to vote you out as chairman and you took a preemptive action by calling in HUD. 
Is there any validity to this? No, there, that has been uh, reported in the press. I had uh, initially wanted to um, step down. In Philadelphia, the controller of the city of Philadelphia has two appointments. The mayor has two appointments, and the fifth is appointed by the other four. So it would be an impossibility for anyone to, to ask me to step down because I appointed myself. Uh, the situation occurred that, um, that I was asked by two other board members to at least stay as a minimum to October as chairman. But I believe that based upon the circumstances of the last few months, of the problems that we are having internally, of increasing political pressures uh, in relationship to hiring, in relationship to firing, and the problems that occurred in relationship to the approval of the one-year plan and the union agreement, which I had hoped everyone would be in favor of, and eventually was approved, uh, that HUD takeover was the only way uh, to manage to move forward in a comprehensive fashion. I do plan on resigning uh, next month and giving my appointment to the mayor of Philadelphia, because I do believe in the end that it is the responsibility of one local enforcement agency, which has to be, I believe, the mayor of Philadelphia, uh, to bring PHA within the realm of the many different agencies in the city of Philadelphia that have to do with housing, and there are too many. Now, my understanding is that, uh, correct me again, um, <coughs> you were alleged to have made the statement the Philadelphia Housing Authority was too mired in political corruption. That's correct. To oversee hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funds. What we have going on here is a complete money grab. Is yes, that an I'm, accurate? I, made, I'm, I, I would, the gist is correct. Uh, for your information, Mr. Chairman, I had asked a year ago for HUD to step in with an overseer. I asked six months ago at a press conference with the mayor of Philadelphia that I felt that, I had, that HUD should come in with an overseer, which would be a special master. And I felt last week that it left me no other alternative than to state publicly again as the chairman of the Housing Authority that I felt at that time that the Housing Authority should be taken over at a minimum of one year uh, to make sure that we move what to the next platform. What did HUD tell you six months ago? There was no response from HUD. Whom did you talk to at HUD? I made a public statement uh, at, uh, when the, uh, there was a Brophy Commission which was initiated by our new mayor, Mayor Randell, to analyze the different agencies in Philadelphia. There are many agencies that are involved in housing. And one of the reasons why we have no housing policy is there are a lot of people in Philadelphia that make a lot of money from, from poverty. Um, one of the things we are attempting to do in Philadelphia is to streamline that and coordinate it between, uh, into one, uh, one organization. Uh, at, that, at the announcement of the Brophy Commission, I asked uh, that HUD appoint an overseer, and I received no response. Did you follow up? No, I was asked, uh, at that time I wanted to resign, but was asked by the, uh, the mayor to stay on, and 2,000 tenants signed a petition asking me to stay on as chairman of the Housing Authority, so I did. Congressman Shays. Uh, I, I just want to be clear, a, a public statement, did you write to HUD and say I want there to be a special master appointed? Did you call someone up specifically ask you? Did you just tell the world this? At that time I told the world, Congressman. Uh, I also didn't write to, the, to HUD the last I, week when I, asked the same, when I asked for the same statement. Well, I, I am not here, if I, if I can continue, I am not here to blame HUD. No, 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 but I, no I, I don't care who you're here to blame. And I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but you gave the impression that you asked for someone, uh, you, you gave the impression that basically you asked HUD to appoint someone and you didn't ask HUD. And it's, it's, just, I, it's blatantly untrue. You just made a public statement that that should happen. Well, when an official of Philadelphia makes a public statement, it is usually, it was looked at last week. No, and I, I was the same, if I can't continue, sure. I was the same official last week when I asked for HUD to take over as I was six months ago when I asked HUD to take over in relationship to bringing someone on board. The statement six months ago was less emphatic, but what I asked was that HUD should be involved in no, bringing someone on board to be involved who, in the day-to-day -day -day decision making. Who did you ask? Did, well, you, uh, did you ask the separate secretary? Did you ask someone who, ha uh, who specifically did you ask? Again, I am only stating that I made a public statement. No, I, no. I am not saying that HUD was was uh, irresponsible by no, not responding. I, I know you're not saying that. I just want to make sure what you are saying. I, I want it on the record, if that's right, if I may just pursue this. Please. Did you contact anyone in writing that uh, HUD should take over 
uh, the management of the Housing Authority? No, I did not. Did you uh, public? Did you call someone up? No, I did uh, not. Okay, so you did not contact HUD to ask them to take over the Housing Authority. Is that not true? That the qu just answer the, the question. This. I made a public statement. No, I, I asked comment. the question. Well, that's all I did. No, no, but I asked, did you contact anyone at HUD? I made no independent communication. Then. No. What do you mean independent communication? No, I made no additional communication the beyond the press The answer is simply comment. no. The answer is no. You did not ask anyone. Isn't that the answer? I did not ask anyone. You did not contact anyone at HUD? No, I did not. Okay. I did not contact anyone. Why? Because it, right after that, I was asked to stay on as chairman. And I felt that as we were moving forward, that with the uh, Brophy Commission, which is initiated by the new mayor of Philadelphia, Mayor Rendell, that we would begin to have better coordination of the different agencies that were involved in housing. Well, I just ask, if the inference is that you didn't think someone should take it over then. And you certainly didn't contact anyone I didn't, at HUD. No, I, yeah, I did not. It was not as emphatic as the movement that I took last week, which, which resulted in a bipartisan effort. And I commend HUD on coming in and taking over the Philadelphia Housing well, Project. Well, did you contact anyone a week ago and specifically ask them? I had had my office uh, begin meetings with the, uh, with the mayor of Philadelphia, and uh, I made affirmative action at that time, yes. Did, did you contact anyone at HUD requesting that they take over the Housing Authority? Representatives of my office began to meet with representatives of the regional director of HUD. Uh, began to or met with them? Met with them, yes. Okay. And did they ask? Yes. That's your sworn testimony. But you did not ask. I did not ask. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May I ask what the forum was where you made the first suggestion? The first, uh, I'm sorry. The first suggestion uh, that was made in 1991 was the, uh, the announcement of the Brophy Commission, uh, which was a commission established. And in what context did you make the suggestion? When I announced that I was in favor of the Brophy Commission and would stand by the recommendations of the Brophy Commission in relationship to my position as chairman and my position as a, as a member of the Board of Commissioners of PHA, I also asked that, the, uh, that, that HUD begin to be involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the Housing Authority. This was an oral statement? Yes, sir. To what forum? It was to the forum of... Uh, it was a, a press conference in the mayor's hall uh, in front of the major media and the print media. Mm -hmm. Congressman Mackley. Thank you very much. Uh, I do want to reiterate, if I can, excuse me, uh, I am not here to play any fault. If I wanted to pursue that in January, I would have pursued it. But I don't want anyone to think that it was not something that I thought of last week, but was something that I felt was on an ongoing basis in my own mind in relationship to the problems that we were having at the authority. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I might, I, m my problem is that it's really a meaningless gesture. I mean, the implication to this committee, I was left with the feeling that you had made a request. And, and in fact, you had not made a request. You had made yeah. a statement. I am merely telling you that so that you yeah. understand that it was something that I did not all of a sudden think of at 4.30 in the afternoon before a 5 o'clock press conference but was something that had been on my mind for quite a bit of time. Yeah. I, guess my, I guess I'm giving editorial comment. I think it's a meaningless gesture to make a public statement at a press conference and not follow it up with a specific contact uh, with someone at HUD. And I think that... that, uh, that, assuming, that I, assuming that that was what I eventually decided had to happen at that given point in time. I did not believe, after conversations with the mayor and after the movement of the Brophy Commission, that it was necessary that HUD take over at that time. I merely mentioned it in this proceedings because I wanted you to understand that it was not something that I thought of as far as HUD taking it over, something that just happened on a Tuesday. I didn't wake up and say, gee, let's have HUD take over PHA. It was something in the back of my mind for a period of time that I felt would be the ultimate step uh, that would have to be taken if, no, if nothing else was going to work. I guess my comment to you, though, is that it's really a meaningless act because uh, you made a comment at a press conference, didn't follow it up, and subsequently, I guess, decided it shouldn't happen. So therefore, I wonder why we're even mentioning it. I'm but only mentioning, as I'm, I'm, and I'll repeat it again, I'm only mentioning it so that you understand my state of mind not because I have any fault on HUD not taking oh, yeah, over. Okay, because no, there should be no fault at HUD. <coughs> no, I'm not saying there was. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I don't think anyone here believes that either you two gentlemen caused this problem because you were relatively late comers to the uh, problem. Is that correct? I mean, you both came on board in 90 or 
91? 90, approximately two years. So, yeah. uh, did you, at the time, Mr. Payone, since you had been working for the city, did you know of the extent and depth of the problems at the public, uh, the uh, Philadelphia Housing? Okay, yeah. I, I left city government 10 years before 1982. Uh, uh, let me say this. In, in, when you work in city government and you're in the housing field, you have some general knowledge. And even in 1982 when I left, the general knowledge was there were problems at PHA. Specific knowledge, no. So you took this job thinking this was going to be a wonderful opportunity no, to excel? No. No. <laughs> no. I took the job because when you work in city government, and I worked there as an intern, my first job, and worked there for 10 years, and worked for 11 housing directors in 10 years, and you saw them come and go, you said to yourself, I can do a job just as good as they can. I know the good points, and I know their bad points. And when you leave government and you work in the private sector, you find that the, there are certain rewards to the private sector that you don't have the aggravations of city government. The only way I would have come back in city government if I had an opportunity to head an agency. So no, I, I came back because there's a certain amount of pride in, in the fact that I worked 10 years in government and I wanted to come back and prove that I can work with an agency. But you knew, I mean, this, this was is no going easy on job. for 13 this is, years, this is no even when job. you were working there this in 1982. Right? You knew it was a disaster. I mean, isn't that fair? I, you know, I, I had in, in my 10 years in city government maybe four conversations about PHA with the, one, of, one of the former executive directors. There was not a lot of communications between the formal city housing office and, and PHA. PHA operated in a universe of its own. I'm trying to give you uh, a way of explaining what the s scenario was when you took the job. Are you oh, telling no, us you didn't know that this was a disaster? Oh, no. I, this is, I said earlier, this is, this is a tough job, sure. I knew public housing was a disaster. I mean, I, I knew that, you know, it was not part of any universe in the city that public housing, uh, you can drive by the developments. I was born and raised five blocks from one of those developments. They were bad when I was a kid. And, you know, they, they, they had the same problems, what, 30 years later? Did, did you know the magnitude? I mean, there's one thing to su su suggest that this may not be a great year for the Boston Red Sox, but when you see the statistics, you know it. Yeah. Now, no, did I, you have a, just a gut sense that this was a problem yeah. and then you got I, into I, it? I did not know the magnitude until, until I got there. And there's really you know, an eight-month to one-year learning curve at the Housing Authority. I did not, when I took this job, I did not know the magnitude of the problems that existed at the Housing Authority. Now, since, since you've been there, you've had a chance to learn firsthand. I've grown very old in a short period uh, of time. I'm sure, sure you have. Uh, and you indicated that... Uh, you did have some some uh, debate or, or some some other uh, input to the uh, IG's final report. Uh, I'd like to just go through and if we can just deal with it briefly. This, so this, this IG's report. Yes. yes. So staff staff met with two members of the IG's office yes. uh, for an exit interview, and okay. we presented them with our response, which is approximately 100 pages. Right. H have you submitted that for the record? It's right here. I have, I've asked to do that, sir. Okay. Well, can I just go through the eight points which are sure. uh, in the IG's report to see whether you agree? The first point is that the Philadelphia Housing Authority failed to provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing to tenants. And in fact, they suggest that 99% based on looking at 86. They, they looked at 86 units. 11 of those were vacant. Let me say this. Let me say, generally speaking, I agree with the philosophical comment, and that's been true of housing, the Housing Authority for the last 30, 40 years in the city of Philadelphia. Specifically, if I can comment, 11 of the, the units they looked at were vacant. They, they may have been short-term vacants or long-term vacants. A vacant unit by, by any standard may be trashed or vandalized and, may not, and normally would not meet this. Of those, 56 of the remaining were minor repairs. The other 20-odd were major repairs. Uh, the PHA has over 4,500 vacant uh, units. That is a correct statement, if I, and if I may categorize that, approximately 2,000 of those are long-term uh, vacants due to modernization, um, either under CAP or MROP. Those are comprehensive improvement assistance funds or uh, rehabilitation of obsolete projects. Another 1,000 of those are primarily vacant scattered sites in what are quote, considered non-viable areas by the federal government, in which uh, you may get a situation where one house is standing on a block, or you may get a, a situation where the house is structurally dangerous, et cetera, and the, and the HUD office says you cannot reinvest money 
in that particular dwelling. Now, uh, do you think that of 2,300 units having 4,500 vacant is a relatively high vacancy sure, it's, it's rate? Sure, it's, it's 19, 20 percent, but you got to get, again, I'm trying to explain, there are some of those are planned vacancies. Right. If you subtract the 2,000 and the 1,000, you remain with another 1,000. Of, of those, um, the majority of them have problems with lead-based paint that inhibits us from, from readily or quickly rehabilitating them. They first must be tested. Mm -hmm. Until recently, there was not a standard HUD policy, and I don't, I don't even know if there currently is, on the testing for lead-based paint. Once you do the testing and you find a lead-based paint is there, then you have to either remove it and or encapsulate it, which becomes very expensive. And the, and the whole process of testing and encapsulation is really in its infancy at this point. So you're satisfied that 4,500 is an acceptable number? No, I, I didn't say it's acceptable. I, I'm telling you some of the, the, the reasons why it is, they are vacant. They're having 10, there are many vac having 10 vacancies is not acceptable. Yeah. Well, sometimes it is acceptable if they're, in fact, uh, uh, the s within the standard norm. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're outside the standard norm and it's just benign neglect or stupidity or, or malfeasance there, there or mismanagement, some, there, there then there it's is, not acceptable. Yeah, there, Would you put 4,500 vacant units in a standard norm out of 23, or is that much beyond what would be considered a standard norm? In a it is much beyond a standard norm if you take into consideration, again, the, the planned vacancies and the fact that many of those are non-viable areas. And so I w would you suggest that is a critical problem with the Philadelphia Housing Agency? Sure it is. It's a critical problem because, again, we inherited 110-year-old scattered sites. Right. And if that is such a critical problem, I've read your uh, status of public housing in Philadelphia summary report. Yes, sir. Uh, was that spelled out here uh, explicitly as one of the critical problems? Vacancies are spelled out as a critical problem. I don't remember verbatim the exact report. But yes, we, we, we describe vacancies as a critical problem. Did you put out this report as chairman or executive, as director? executive director? Yes. And is, is it in here? Again, that was issued, um, I don't remember. February 27th, 1992. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the, the report verbatim. But vacancies, I will agree with you, are a significant problem. At the I, I, I couldn't find vacancies in here. Maybe it's there, but I certainly didn't I'm see sorry, it as, I don't as a highlighted issue, uh, if it's a critical problem. Uh, maintenance and repairs are not timely is the third uh, you would, I would agree with that. issue. I would agree with that. In the IG report, it says that they have, uh, 300 and, you have 324 vehicles, but you deploy only 172 to maintenance staffs. Is there that are some 50, 60 vehicles, uh, maybe not that much. There's vehicles for the police force or some probably 30, 40 vehicles for the police force. Uh, keep in mind, when they describe a vehicle, we're talking everything from a trash truck to a, uh, a, a compactor to, uh, you know, um, one to of the a sedan? Things, like a, a step van or the things that the roofers carry with them, you know, we, the kettles, so to speak. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it has four wheels on it and, it, and it's gas powered. Well, how many of these are sedans that are unrelated to maintenance people? I don't, I don't know. There may be 50 sedans. I, I just, 50? Uh, yeah. Most of them are step vans, trash compactors, steak, steak trucks, steak body trucks, um, other related to maintenance you, vehicles. How many of your top executives have uh, sedans that are paid for by the, uh, the Public Housing Authority? Myself and the, the deputies have vehicles. There are three deputies and senior management people who are required to go out to the various sites and vehicles. Keep so, in mind, there so are... It roughly less than a half dozen? Approximately, yeah. Why then does an article in the Philadelphia Daily News on May 27th, 1992 say that 89 of PHA's 324 vehicles are assigned to administrative staff, well, such as PHA Board Chairman Jonathan Seidel, and Executive Director John Palin. Many of, I, I, I said I have a vehicle. Many oh. of those other sedans are pool cars located in the various sites. We have 42 developments, 7,400 scattered sites, four warehouse facilities, uh, police stations, uh, undercover activities by police officers. Some of the vehicles are loaned to us by the state attorney general. Um, and it, 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 literally, you know, this is the fifth largest city in the United States, you, and we have a development in each corner of the city. And you have to get to each and every one of them. That's precisely the point of my question. 
if you have yourself and everybody else driving home and all over the city, you don't have the maintenance people going to the site to make the repairs. The well, question here, if I may continue, sure. is not whether you merit a car. The question is, should there be such a disproportionate number of people who are engaged in maintenance having vehicles relative to everybody else when in fact 99% of the 88 units which were inspected aren't not habitable. We're not talking about a, 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 a relatively small degree of uh, disrepair. No. And so I would suggest let me, let me that uh, that's a question that I if I was on your board, I'd certainly be asking for a full report. And it's a concern for me uh, as we look over this that uh, we can't get the work done. And I think it's, it goes to the very essence of why you are here as opposed to every other city because not necessarily you, but the public, uh, the uh, Philadelphia Housing Agency, because your money is not going to the repair of the buildings. You have a very bad track record. You couldn't even spend the money. Your organizational management was so inept. And we so have had significant problems spending money. I would, I would concur with that. Uh, so that uh, our, our problem is that it. it's not getting to the right place. Let me just continue, uh, because I know the hour is late. And we want to just finish up. Uh, you say that tenants, uh, the IG says that tenants owe over 6.5 million in rent. The chairman has talked about that issue. Uh, that is true. A lot of that is historical rent, um, many, much of it dating back three, four years ago. And interestingly enough, a, a proportion of that, uh, probably about a million dollars, has to do with bankruptcy, which is a relative, which is a phenomenon relative to Pennsylvania that may not affect other housing authorities. Look at this chart. Doesn't that give you a nice rosy picture about your successes in collecting rent? We have had successes in collecting rent. And, and we, is, we, is that $6.5 million in rent uh, a good, good uh, depiction of again, this chart? We've increased in the last two years rent collection from, little, from about 70% to about 85% at this point. I can't justify why the Housing Authority didn't collect rent over the last 10 years. I, I just can't do that. For there may be many valid reasons. One of the things we've tried to do is get the managers, tell the managers that it's part of their job, among other things, to collect the rent. Okay, we've had some success in doing that. Uh, Mr. Seidel, are, are, as the Comptroller of the City, are, are you satisfied with the collections of rent and do you think that you are moving in such substantial directions uh, as these charts show here and uh, this chart shows, which is dramatic. I was an engineering undergrad and if I look at that I say, wow, you guys are, ought to be getting awards instead of having the federal government take you over. I think that the... Um the movement from 70% to 85% is commendable in relationship to the collection of rents on a current basis and forward. I do not believe that, and you look at the end product of the Philadelphia Housing Authority, that, that anything is commendable. One of the reasons why we instituted the one-year plan and signed an agreement for an overhaul of maintenance and design of construction with the Building Trades Council of the City of Philadelphia to, was to bring in competent help to form teams to make sure that the work product was proper and that there was accountability. <coughs> I think that if you look at the authority moving forward, uh, you will see that, w that they, are, they have an ability to reach the next plateau. Unfortunately, I don't believe that the, uh, I think that the, the theory of PHAs in general should be rethought, but I do believe that if you're looking at this authority in particular, that there has been some movement of, in a positive direction that, that should not be shortchanged. I believe that the problems are overwhelming. Um, I think that they should have been attacked by the administrations of the City of Philadelphia for the last 20 years. I wish they were. Uh, the Housing Authority got, came into existence 15 years before I was born. I wish I was around to help it then. Unfortunately, I wasn't. Uh, but I do believe, and I don't, I don't really, I'm not familiar with the document you're holding. You're the chairman, right? Yes. Is this put out by the Philadelphia Housing Authority? Yes, there's many documents put out by an authority of 1,700 employees with, uh, that did not need board approval. That is supposed to be, I understand, uh, statistical analysis based upon internal information. It's kind of scary. Well, I can't uh, suggest that you should know everything, but uh, uh, when I just read this document, which uh, was in a packet that I received from the, uh, yeah, this, was, this was submitted to, by you. I mean, we didn't dig this up. Is this your packet that you give out to people? 
I don't give out the packet. I don't well, know what was presented. You're the chairman to you. of the board. I'm not yes, asking that, you to know every day to day. I don't. I don't know what happens on an everyday basis in the city of Philadelphia either. But I don't know. That I, I would assume that there is a packet from PHA because it has a logo on there. Well, you, and I have seen that document in the past. Okay. But so I do believe because I think that was your question. I do believe that it is commendable that there has been an increase from current forward in rent collection. I don't necessarily believe that, uh, that just because you write off that that should be looked at as an improvement. But I do believe that one of the things that was asked by the Housing Authority Board of Commissioners was that a balance sheet be truly reflective of the reality that exists today and not to artificially inflate accounts receivable that cannot be collected. Well, as I read this, and I'm sorry that you haven't, and I would suggest that you do, and in fact I'll share with you my copy if you don't have one, uh, it presents a fairly rosy picture of, of what's going on. In fact, it might uh, suggest that, although the first sentence says that there are serious, have, having suffered in the past tense, serious uh, <coughs> problems, this is only in February, the things seem like they're moving along. And uh, it, it sort of contradicts uh, this uh, testimony that uh, uh, everyone was, in fact, very much concerned and, and thinking of being taken over by the federal government because things were in chaos. And I, I commend you for trying, but uh, uh, the documents don't support the, the testimony. And I'd like to continue on because I think that uh, we are ta taking a lot of time, and I think there's another witness that needs to testify. Um, one of the things that I just frankly can't understand is how these units for so long could have been missing in action. Okay. Uh, and you've, I suppose, tried to explain it, but when you took over, uh, did you uh, ask what do we have in inventory and have we verified it? Well, when I, when I took over, I obviously asked how many units do we have in both high rises, low rises, <coughs> scattered sites, and turnkey threes, and even in section eights. Um, like I said, there's a, there's a, there's really a six month learning curve sure. when when you get there. Um, I was not aware of quote unquote missing units, so to speak. When it was brought to my attention that we had to reconcile with the ACC the missing units, we initiated the survey right. and came up with the 490 95 units. So it's not like we didn't try to try to try to find them. Okay, and so today you have a accurate inventory. Yes. And, and finally, uh, it says you need to reform its administration of the public housing program, and that they talk about uh, all these uh, contracts which have been let, mm -hmm. and it was $267,000. Uh, have you done anything to uh, they, minimize they, the they number? They refer, I think, to probably 12 or 13 contracts there. Mo most of those contracts uh, are... Uh, one of them was for uh, the admissions policy, which was required by HUD. I think it was like $45,000. They're open competitive bid contracts that cannot be done. We don't have the capability to do them house. We have four lawyers in house. Most of our time is spent in landlord tenant court, quite frankly, on, on those four lawyers and a couple paralegals. When you, re when you do something out of the ordinary, and um, in Pennsylvania we have a problem with something called four part bidding, where you have to bid electrical, plumbing, um, carpentry separate, which presents a, a problem for us. So we, we, we needed to see if we can get the legislature to change that and put together an analysis to do that. In-house lawyers are just not capable of doing that. So you do have to go sometimes out of, out of house to, to bring on legal expertise, even architectural ex expertise. So your testimony today is that uh, the, uh, it's $257,644 in outside consulting fees are justified? Well, again, I mean, I want to make a general statement because I don't know each and every one of those contracts. But again, we do not have the capability in-house to re rewrite the admissions policy. Why then does the uh, IG suggest that uh, much of this is duplicative? Do you disagree I, that's, with that? You know, I would disagree with that, and we had to, we had to, we we've discussed that with them. And did it draw your attention to the fact that two contracts, number two hundred seven and two ninety one? For nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars and ninety-nine cents. Under, yes, one of those was were a legal contract. designed specifically to get around the ten. No, I, no, no, I don't know. No. One of those th that was the, the the value of the work to be performed. I believe one of those was a legal contract. I believe one of those was a um, architectural contract. Why the odd number, nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars and ninety-nine cents? Was that a sale? You got two for one no, or something? No. I mean, what was all, the? What was the? Yeah, all all, all all contracts are I mean, nego I, negotiated I was, through the general council. Come on. I mean, I, I wasn't I, born yesterday. Now, either that had a, f a specific uh, uh, ring to it because it's such a unique number, or uh, it was purely random. Which was it? 
Purely random? Is that your testimony? It may be purely random. I, I, didn't, I, don't, I didn't negotiate those contracts. What I'm saying to you that you, you can have a contract for under $10,000 according to the, the PHA procurement policy that, that is acceptable. And I don't know the content of the contract, but they were, they, one involved legal work and I believe one involved architectural services. Does that is if my friend will yield, did the same person negotiate this contract who negotiated the contract with the former executive director? No, I don't believe so. No. no. And your testimony on their oath is that the fact that the contract is just for under $10,000 is a sheer coincidence. No, I didn't say it was a coincidence. I said that was the negotiated amount that was reached between the person negotiating the contract. And the fact that above 10000 approval is required had nothing to do with that. It may have something to do with that. What happens under t over $10,000, you have to go through a formal bidding process, where that's, under $10,000, you go through an informal that's bidding process. That's precisely the point. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, does Mr. Gray have a consulting contract with you? Gray <coughs> business that he testified earlier? No, he does not. <coughs> Kurt Gray, the Gray Group? No. Did he have one in 1991? He has had not had a contract as long as I've been there. I don't know if he's had one previous to that. Were you there in 1991? Yes. He did not have one in 1991. <coughs> one second. Was, was his testimony? Did he have a consulting contract? No. 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 Almost everyone who has looked at this organization, and I think Mr. Seidel, you've mentioned this as one of the serious barriers. Uh, can you explain how this patronage evolves? I mean, this is supposed to be a non-political entity, I mean, uh, in the sense that people are supposed to get jobs based on merit. How are people getting jobs and who's pushing it if it's a politically motivated organization? Most of the employees that I'm aware of um, held positions in this authority for a long period of time. What concerned me was that, that there are a number of employees in significant positions that had to be terminated. And the minute you do attempt to terminate and try to move to the next plateau of then acquiring professional people uh, to do professional tasks, that there would be a tremendous amount of resistance uh, from other members of the board, that there would be a tremendous amount of resistance from the political whirlwind that exists in any large urban area, I'm, I'm generalizing, but I would assume that it is the same. I would hope it is not. Um, it is part of a system of, uh, of working things backwards that I have seen for a number of years, which is unfortunate, and that is that uh, people come and are, 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 this is before, the, I've only been there 26 months and don't plan on being there more than a month more anyway. But it is the reality of, uh, of political politics that exists anywhere, and that is that people are hired based upon who they know. And the, the reality that exists in Philadelphia, and I think that should exist in the housing authorities throughout this country, is that that nonsense can't continue. And I was concerned that it would continue um, and would destroy whatever minimal amount of, uh, of movement did take place. And I felt that, that HUD, as an independent operation, beyond the scope of the influence of Philadelphia, I would be able to institutionalize professionalism uh, within the next year. Ms. Payon, were you unable to fire anyone? I have terminated employees at the Housing Authority for cause. For cause? Yes. <clears throat> so did you feel the same pressures politically that you could not go in and clean house? There were significant pressures, yes, political pressures. And is you, do you think that an independent source outside of the political appointment process can fire everyone and start all over? Well, I think any executive director of a large city housing authority, and it's, this is not atypical of Philadelphia, there, there's, there's many large city housing authorities that I've seen, I know about, have had problems with historically with patronage. I think anyone who runs a housing authority should have a, should be independent, have a contract, be able to make decisions that are sometimes, uh, you know, in the, not mitigated by outside forces. I guess what bothers me about that answer is that not every city apparently has the same problems. Otherwise, we would have a federal marshal taking over every city's uh, public housing authority. So that it would seem to me that 
while you talk about it as this is just the norm for every right. city and town yeah. in America, there, that that really ought not to be a statement that you're expecting us to believe. There are some very good housing authorities in this nation. You asked, or someone asked earlier, and I would say some of the better ones are located in Virginia, Richmond, Newport News, et cetera. There are housing authorities that have significant problems, which, which I think was stated here also, Kansas City, New Orleans, Chester, Pennsylvania, et cetera. Um, I'm not saying it's the norm. I'm saying that historically, from information that, or my perception is historically, housing authorities have been susceptible to political patronage. How are you? Congressman Shays. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, Mr. Payon, has anyone uh, working for the public uh, housing authority in Philadelphia, employer or contract, ever worked on your home, car, or other property? No, not, no. Mr. Sedell, I ask you the same question? No. Okay. Have they ever been over at your homes? No. Okay. Not in my home, no. So the answer to either of you, uh, both of you, is that they've n n employees have never even been at your home, so... We're, we're my, my answer is no. No. Okay. okay. I just want that on the record because it's been alleged that. So it's nice to have your testimony that hasn't. Um, what is the, uh, Mr. Payon, what is the operating uh, budget? I'm hearing so many different numbers, I'd like to nail it down. It, it's a, if you look at pure operating budgets, approximately $100 million, not, not including. Could you speak up a little bit? Yeah, I'm sorry, it's approximately $100 million, not including any CAP or MROP money. And this is for 23? Uh, approximately 23,000 units. Yeah, it's okay. 22,600 something. Um, have either of you ever tried to thwart any audits or investigations of James Feldman? No. No. Okay. Um, there was a 1990 audit of property and inventories. Did either of you refuse to release this audit? No, I'm, I'm not intimately aware of the, of the audit. I did not refuse to, to release it. Are you unintimately aware? No, I'm, I'm not familiar with the audit. Okay, so you're not aware of any audit? No. Okay. Is that your test? I'm not aware of the audit. I don't have the power to stop it, and uh, I okay. wouldn't if I did. Thank you. Um, I look at our cities, and I think they're kind of in ruin. <laughs> and uh, I look at our public housing authorities and feel the same way and begin to think this is not a good advertisement for uh, local control. Um, we face uh, a lot of serious challenges running our cities and our housing authorities, and I guess what I want to ask um, Mr. Sedell. Yes, sir. You appointed yourself. Yes. To be on the board. Did you yes. have another appointment as well? I had uh, two appointments. I appointed uh, Ms. Sandra MacArthur, who was the chief of staff to Senator Fata, state senator Fata. I, I, I don't need to know who they are, but, but how many members are on the board? Five. And how many of those members uh, were appointed by you? Two. Me yes. and uh, myself and another. So you have two of the five members. That's correct. Um, who makes the other three the appointments? The mayor makes the other two appointments, and the fifth is, uh, is elected by the other four. The other fifth, uh, in this case, uh, Congressman, is uh, Ms. Peggy Jones, who is a tenant leader. So basically, you're telling me that you, you effectively controlled, uh, in terms of appointment, half of those who were appointed, and, the, and then your, your two appointees would help choose uh, the, f the fifth with, in conjunction with the other two appointees. Well, effectively, they would have to be... If, if myself, uh, it has never come to a vote for the fifth. Uh, the fifth was on the board and remains on the board um, uh, beyond my tenure because I'm leaving next month. So I have never had an opportunity to appoint a fifth. Okay. Um, I'm just curious why with, with your busyness, uh, as you are the controller, correct? Yes. Of the city. And that's an elected position? Yes, it is. Why, why in the world would you appoint yourself? Well, you know, you make stupid mistakes in life. Uh, <laughs> when I... Uh, when I ran for controller of Philadelphia, one of the things I wanted to see in 1989 was uh, what the actual job entailed. And one of the things, one of the items that, that nobody really ever talked about was the, having two appointments on the Housing Authority. The uh, former controllers have always just appointed uh, a clergyman, someone that they had known, and, and, and there was always a hands-off approach and nobody really paid attention. Certainly in Philadelphia, nobody ever paid attention to PHA. It was federally funded. It never affected the city budget. Uh, it was an entity that existed somewhere um, out in left field. Uh, I had a press conference in 1989 at the Raymond Rosen Project. Don't tell me about press conference. Okay. Well, I had a press conference there uh, in which I, I looked at the Housing Authority, and when I 
An appointment came up. I asked if there was anyone that wanted to be involved with the Housing Authority. I couldn't find anybody uh, that I felt um, would be, have the commitment that is necessary to see what's going on, and I appointed myself. It's what they call leading with your chin. Well, either that or uh, making mistakes about making public comments at press conferences. I, I don't see the relevancy of, of your even talking about a press conference and your appointment. What's, I, 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 it, it goes over no, my I'm head. Just, again, I am just giving you I'm just giving you a rundown of how, in my frame of mind, I came about the decision to appoint myself. At a press conference? I'm just giving you a rundown of, of my frame of mind as to how I decided to appoint myself. Okay. Um, would you say that you were an active participant on the board? Yes. Do you know what's going on in the board? I was an active participant in spending a tremendous amount of my own personal time at the 42 developments to see what is going on and try to help people, yes. See, because the indictment is, you're telling me... Well, I, 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 would, uh, sure. I would object to the term indictment. Well, let me finish. Let me. The, the indictment is that, that, that um, it's hard for me to imagine um, you're telling uh, HUD in a press conference or whatever, not really telling HUD, telling the world, that, that this should be taken over when you are basically, you and one other person uh, are, are, are intimately involved with the operation of this housing authority. I mean, uh, you're an active participant. Was your appointment an active participant? Appointing myself was an active participation. Yeah, and you appointed someone else? Yes. And was that person an active participant? Um, yeah, I would assume so. Well, don't assume. Were they or weren't they? Yeah, they're as active as anyone else has been. Well, that, uh, what does that say? Well, it's... Were they as active as you? No. Did they attend meetings? Yes. So they attended meetings. You attended meetings? Yes. Okay, did you make most of the meetings? Yes. Uh, just a majority or, or, or clearly almost everyone? Clearly almost everyone. Okay. And your appointment did as well? She made a majority of the meetings, yes. The, um, what I'm wrestling with is that basically when you ask HUD to take over, it's an acknowledgement that you failed. It's an acknowledgement of a failure, yes. It's an acknowledgement that the Housing Authority, of which you are a board member, you are not an observer. You are an active participant. You've That's told me that. Yes. In spite of the fact that you didn't know about this. this no, report. I didn't say I didn't know about that. Okay, what did what you I say? What I said was that I'm not familiar with the graphs, but I felt the response from the Congressman was, I felt that it was commendable that there was an increase in the rent collections from the present time forward. Okay. Well, um, it, it, what happens, usually it's HUD that comes in and says, we need to take over because the board's not doing a good job. Uh, would you agree that basically the board is the one that runs the housing authority? Yes. Okay. So you're basically saying you and your, and your appointee, as well as the three other appointees, were not doing a very good job? No, I believe that at that this stage, uh, that this authority could not be run with the current board uh, which I'm a member, and, 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 I felt, and I felt, if I can't continue, sure. I felt for the benefit of the tenants um, that I would take the, destroy what political capital I had left uh, to ask for HUD to come in. And yeah. I felt that that was a responsible move on my part uh, as a member of the board and as the chairman. Right, which you never ended up asking them to do. I did. I asked them last week and they did come in and okay. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that no, they did. Your, your staff asked them? Well, no. I. I had been in communication, but the, you, you no, had no, asked no, me. No, 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 we're not going to let that happen. You, I, I tried to nail down what you had been in communication. Had you specifically asked HUD to take over the Housing Authority? I had been in, my office had been in communication with the Regional Director's Office. I didn't ask office. if your office, I asked if you. Not directly at that time, no. No. Not, not, but at what time were you directly asking them? Right afterwards. Right after what? Right after I made the announcement, uh, in cooperation with Mayor Rendell. Who did you contact? Mayor Rendell, and then we met with uh, Mr. Smith. No, Mayor Ma what? He, he's not the he's not HUD. Who is HUD? Who did you speak with? I'm trying to Mr. nail. Mr. Smirconish. Was a Mr. Smirconish and a Mr. Cutler who was involved in the regional office of HUD. Okay, and you you made this request when? Um, a number of days ago. A few uh, days ago. Uh, about a, I guess ten days ago. Uh, before you were asked to appear, or here, or after? I don't remember when I was asked to appear here. I, I, I don't. 
After? I don't remember. Okay. I got a fax and I don't, I don't remember exactly when that happened. So you were asked to appear here and subsequent to that you basically said HUD should take over the operation. Uh, did Mr. G uh, former Mayor Good, um, is he also on the board? Yes, he appointed himself. Okay. I'm having a rough time understanding why a mayor wants to put himself on the Housing Authority, a controller wants to put himself on the Housing Authority. What am I supposed to conclude from that? I don't know. You, I, you can only conclude the why I appointed myself was to try to do some good for people that deserve some good, and you'd have to ask mayor, former Mayor Good why he appointed himself. And I'd be interested in hearing his comment. Um. Mr. Chairman, I guess we can just go on to the next one. Uh, next Be before we do, our Chief of Staff has a question. Thank you. Mr. Payone, why did it take you two years to come up with your one-year plan? In the two years that, that, that I was there, uh, we, I, I, including the senior staff and the board, tried to institute a number of reforms. As I said earlier, um, my first six to eight months were, were learning primarily curve, learn, right? well. No, in addition to learning curve, had to do with the financial situation. Uh, we looked at the the security issue. We looked at issues that related to resident services, health care, job the first employment. Six months. No, th th throughout, throughout. Okay, um, job care, uh, not job, health care, job, job opportunities, employment, employee, or tenant hiring, etc. But how about maintenance? How about we, we looked repairs? at maintenance. We looked at maintenance. We uh, obviously there were significant problems in maintenance. Uh, I re I replaced the director of maintenance, um, made some changes there, um, brought on a new person to head the capital programs division. Um, but excuse me, but one of the cornerstones of your one-year plan is a new effective maintenance department. Why did it take you two years till you got to the stage where you're proposing that and all yeah. these goals are to be met in the, in the next initially year? Initially, I believe... Had you proposed it a year ago, we would be there well, now. Well, in, in hindsight, it's always, you know, the, the best way to, to be there. I believed... But it's not, excuse me, it's not hindsight that we're uh -huh. talking about. It's, it's public housing residents who are told tomorrow, always tomorrow, and now we're told it'll be another year because no. of this one-year plan. Well, I didn't say it'd be another year. I mean, the one-year plan is an implementation strategy. I mean, I, yes, I wish I could have, we should have done it a year ago. I believe that we had the in-house capability and uh, that to make the necessary repairs. And unfortunately, we didn't. Okay, one further question. Last year, HUD gave the Philadelphia Housing Authority $84 million in CAP funds. That was conditioned on the Housing Authority hiring an outside firm to perform construction management. Have you hired such an outside firm, mm -hmm. and if not, why not? No, we have not. The RFPs are on the street, nor have we received the money to date. The RPs are on the, the street? The RFPs, requests for proposals for outside. And when did, when did they go out on the street? Uh, within the last month. Within the, within the last month? Yes. And this was monies that were given in last year to for construction management? No, no, no. The $84.4 million right. in CIAP, the CIAP award was, was announced in November. In November. In 91. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congressman Chase has a question. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Sadell, uh, as a member of the board and as chairman, um, do you feel that Mr. Payone is doing a good job? as an executive director? I think he's uh, done an adequate job under the circumstances. Okay. Um, Mr. Payone, you are still the executive director, and I'm confused by that. Usually when a master comes, a special master comes in or someone, when HUD takes over control, usually I thought the, the executive director is no I, longer I working. I think this is a unique situation. Um, and again, I'm not, historically, I, I understand there have been a limited number of takeovers in the past, and they have been takeovers that have been the result of what's called a breach of the ACC, the annual contributions contract, where HUD comes in, as they did in Chester, Pennsylvania, and effectively removes the board and the executive director and senior staff. This is a, a unique situation. I don't know if it has a precedent anywhere else, quite frankly, in which a, a special master has been appointed who is overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the Housing Authority. What, yeah, the basic, this, basically the special master um, uh, it controls the authority. In other words, the board, he overrules the board. Best of my knowledge, this, the board doesn't meet. Right, frankly. the board doesn't basically exist. It's an advisory. No, it exists. It's advisory. Okay. 
but basically uh, he uh, takes on the functions or she of, of the that, that is correct the he, he or she would approve resolutions that were normally approved by the board I guess I'm just mystified given um, Mr. Sadal you read this report no I've never received an official copy of that I saw that here today for the first time I would assume okay. you're holding up the audit by the uh, right. by HUD I received my copy today also, okay. right here in this room. Right, you saw a draft of it, though. I saw a draft. Yeah, did correct. you see the draft? I saw a draft of it. Did yes. you go over the draft? I went over the draft, yeah. Okay. Did you agree with most of what was in there? I think that the, the, the presentation is accurate. Um, I didn't need the, the HUD to come in and, and tell me what the realities were because I had been out on the street and saw the realities uh, as they exist uh, in Philadelphia. Okay, I'll just conclude because we do have a vote. What, what, I'm, what I'm puzzled by is. I mean, the reality is that 99% of the housing units are not up to, con up, up to what they should be. Uh, and, and what I'm puzzled by is 4,000 plus units are not occupied, of which you were getting, a housing authority, uh, improperly money from HUD that you shouldn't. And it seems to me that, that uh, those are strong indictments of the system and, and the operation of, this, of the housing authority. And, uh, um, and I guess what puzzles me, um, Mr. Payone and Mr. Sedell, is that basically you all were in charge. And somehow we're talking, been wrestling with finally what bothers me. What bothers me is this. There are five people who run the housing authority and executive director. And we've got two of them right here. And so is it your testimony basically that the other members who are not present are the ones who screwed up? No. If you're asking me, uh, as I had stated initially when I came here today, it is my belief that the system is born to fail. And that what you have to do, respectfully, is to change the system. Well, now, we can do everything in the world, but the system is born to fail. If you visit the housing sites that exist in the Housing Authority of Philadelphia, you will find that many of them look like cinder block plateaus. Please don't tell me what they look like. I know what they look like. Okay. No, no, but, 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 but I do know that your maintenance crews didn't have work orders and didn't keep track. And you can't blame that on a building. That's people, and people are in charge. And somehow it seems like both of you are passing the buck. No, and I can only speak for myself, but in 26 months, it took time to find out and root out problems. It took time to be involved with law enforcement agency to root out corruption. And it took time, please let me yeah. finish since you're asking me. It took time to set up a plan. It took time to sign a, an, a union agreement that was never signed for in the history of the city of Philadelphia with the building trades to bring in qualified people. Now, if, if those, I think those actions are positive. Should many more things have been done? Yeah, well, I can sit here and say, I wish to God we had other things. We are moving forward with this week, tomorrow, was a resident initiative summit to try to bring uh, doctors on board at the Housing Authority to well, bring uh, prenatal care and nurses yeah, on the board. Other, the other problem sites, is so. that there were uh, approximately 10 other reports in the last 13 years that uh, basically were a directive of things that could be done to improve. So it wasn't like you had to invent them or discover them. Uh, there have been many, many reports that said specifically what should, action should be taken. Well, I, if, I, if I can respectfully, there was an audit by my office 25 years ago that talked about waste, fraud, and corruption. But the, real, the difference is that it is easy to say things, but it is difficult to implement them. And right. a two-year implementation on a problem that has begun to fester since 1937, I think is some movement. Uh, okay. It may be recognizably as being small, but it is movement. And I think that if you look at it, um, hopefully if the PHAs remain in existence, uh, that there is changes that can occur. And in 10 years, you can look back and say that 10 years ago, at least there was a beginning of a change in Philadelphia Housing Authority for the betterment of the town. I, I would just conclude by saying when we did the HUD investigation of, of HUD Central, we never had anyone use the defense that we went back 30 years ago for the problems. Uh, they basically did not ever make that excuse. I, I can't comment. I just have one observation. Uh, earlier this morning, uh, we had a public housing tenant from Philadelphia, Margie Rose, who testified. Yeah. Did you hear the testimony, Mr. Yes, Payon? I did. Yes, I did. Would you please go out to her unit and uh, inspect it and get back to us in two weeks and tell us what happened to that Sir, unit? Sir, I, I will do that. I will get back to you, but I also leave you with 30 work orders from 1987 to 1990 in which 
Ms. Rose lived in the unit, repairs were made to the unit, and I will get you the additional work orders to 1992. I appreciate it. I want to thank all four of you gentlemen for appearing. We have one final panel, and we will begin with that panel as soon as we cast our votes. We are in recess. Committee will resume. Our final panel is uh, Mr. Joseph G. Schiff, Assistant Secretary for Public and Indian Housing, Department of Housing and Urban Development. Would you please raise your right hand? We solemnly swear the testimony you're about to offer is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Please be seated. <coughs> We're pleased to have you, Secretary Schiff. I'd be grateful if you'd introduce uh, your associates. Uh, your prepared statement will be entered in the record in its entirety, and you may proceed as you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity to be with you today. And before I begin, allow me to introduce the people to my right is the General Deputy Assistant Secretary, Mr. Michael Janis. Glad to, to see you, Mr. Janis. And to my left is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Resident Initiatives, Mr. David Caprera. Pleased to have you. You didn't expect this to be an evening engagement, but uh, uh, we're it happy was, to have was, you. It was more than worthwhile to cancel my afternoon appointments, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I don't think I could strongly enough deplore what you have heard so far today. The story that has been set forth before you is a sad one. And it is my hope that my testimony and comments to your questions today will reflect President Bush and Secretary Kemp's commitment to our responsibilities and to our eagerness to work with Congress on ways to provide decent, safe, and affordable housing for those Americans most in need. Let me also say that the comments you've heard so far today are, as you said at the beginning, not reflective of the vast majority of public housing authorities in America. These authorities are well-run, well-intentioned, responsible public institutions. While I've submitted a lengthy statement that, as you said, will be a part of the record, I would be remiss if I didn't begin my appearance before you by summarizing this administration's record of overseeing troubled public housing authorities and where we're going. You've heard testimony today centering on the operations of two of the very worst housing authorities in America. This was dramatically emphasized last week by HUD's appointment of a special master for the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Undoubtedly, something similar would have been done here in the District of Columbia if it had not been for the election of a new mayor and the selection of a new executive director, both of whom are obviously trying to turn around a sorry situation. It can't be stated often enough that public housing authorities are local entities that are creatures of state law. While HUD has obvious responsibilities to our clients, as you put it, the residents and the taxpayers, we are not the only player in this drama. Some have the misconception that there are 3,115 local HUD offices located in all 50 states. Rather, there are 3,115 local public housing authorities nationwide. Each has its own strengths, weaknesses, and human dynamics. This is not to say that HUD has no responsibility for their operation. Instead, I want to stress the department's res primary responsibilities funding, and oversight. Where this administration has found improprieties in the delivery of services, HUD has taken action. Let me give you a few examples. The executive director and the others involved in the horror of Passaic, New Jersey are now in jail, and HUD initiated a no-holds-barred breach action. This committee, two years ago, conducted hearings into that matter. At our instigation, executive directors have been replaced in D.C., Detroit, Cleveland, New Orleans, and other locations. A default was declared in Chester, Pennsylvania, and a private contractor HUD hired is now operating the agency. 
We forced the Housing Authority of New Orleans to hire a private contractor to both operate the housing and train the local staff. We have entered into a creative partnership with Kansas City, Missouri to administer that severely troubled housing authority. And as I said last week, HUD appointed a special master to assume day-to-day -day control of the Philadelphia Housing Authority. HUD seeks at all time to find solutions rather than to assume a big brother profile. HUD could take over every troubled housing authority in this country, but without the cooperation and leadership from local officials, community activists, business leaders, and the residents themselves, we can only marginally improve the quality of public housing in this country. We found that the high level of leadership and built a partnership in Philadelphia and are now moving forward. These specific actions are the manifestation of our deep concern with troubled housing authorities. Among the systemic reforms and actions we've taken are HUD's placing more power in the hands of residents through the creation of resident management corporations. When this administration took office in 1989, there were only 13 resident management corporations. By the end of this fiscal year, there will be 250, a 2,000 percent increase almost. HUD is insisting that PHAs coordinate more and more of their activities with both their residents and community leadership. Through the Public Housing Management Assessment Program, FEMAP, HUD has developed the first comprehensive set of performance standards ever that will be applied to all PHAs. HUD is taking away the incentive for inappropriate maintenance performance by making modernization funding a formula-driven program rather than one which rewards agencies that let their developments fall apart. HUD has created a number of new program incentives to instill appropriate behavior by the agencies. For example, an alternative operating subsidy formula has been developed to correct inequities in the existing subsidy program. HUD now allows PHAs to retain part of the savings generated by either anti-fraud activities or utility savings. HUD no longer automatically cuts off subsidies to units utilized to support economic self-sufficiency and anti-drug programs in public housing. HUD has made every effort to personally motivate troubled PHAs by face-to-face -face visits by either myself or the General Deputy Assistant Secretary with PHA staff, resident leadership, and local political officials. HUD has vested more authority in the regional administrators so that the unique situations leading to trouble status can be recognized and individualized solutions can be crafted to improve performance. Finally, recognizing that we can't be all things to all people, HUD is aggressively implementing a system of risk analysis and accountability. No longer will HUD be driven by the calendar. It will be driven by the risk posed to the residents and the taxpayers. However, all of our efforts in both the legislative and executive branches are mere window dressing without the active participation of the very people we serve, the men, women, and youth of our public housing developments. One clear example of how resident initiatives buttressed by federal support has led to a 180 degree turnaround in the work, is the work of the Abbotsford Resident Management Council in Philadelphia. Abbotsford Homes, a 700 unit, 3,500 resident complex, became the first RMC in Pennsylvania to reach full management status when it executed its contract in April of 1991. The residents are responsible for leasing, rent collection, evictions, maintenance, and security. They are also involved in partnerships with Temple University and a local foundation on several educational programs that promote scholarships and youth entrepreneurship. Over the last year, Abbotsford's home has been a role model to the PHA. Through its diligent efforts, Abbotsford has set aside $500,000 in its reserve accounts, which can be used for maintenance and other resident initiatives. They are collecting rents at a rate of 91% and are making substantive progress in other areas of management, including vacancies and turnaround time of vacant units. Is everything perfect? Of course not. We are on the right track. I believe so. Still, much remains to be done, both by HUD and Congress. I believe too often HUD has been part of the problem rather than the solution. We need to stop micromanaging efficient, high-performing PHAs and step up our assistance and oversight of troubled agencies. We need to fully implement FEMAP and then allow it to allocate both our resources and our regulatory control. We need to reaffirm that there are no cookie cutter solutions to trouble PHAs and develop the incentive and flexible approaches to assist them better. Congress has a major role to play and responsibilities to meet if we are to achieve our common goals. Congress has to free HUD to provide better oversight to trouble PHAs. Let me give you just a few examples, if I can, of congressional impediments to effective PHA oversight. When HUD tried to get PHAs to build their new development units in a more timely manner, Congress responded by saying HUD cannot recapture new construction grants for at least 30 months. When HUD has tried to give PHAs more flexibility in how to replace demolished public housing units, Congress has said no. 
When HUD tried to crack down on accounts receivable in Indian housing, Congress responded by no, you can't. When HUD decided that the taxpayer shouldn't be subsidizing 104,000 vacant units when our country faces such a serious homeless problem, Congress responded by saying no, thus continuing payments for phantom housing how, assistance. How did Congress say no to not subsidizing vacant housing units? In the 1992 Appropriations Act, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. Congress specifically forbid us to go forward with the regu proposed regulation that was issued in, I believe it was August of last year, that would have cut off subsidy for vacant units. Go ahead. And finally, when HUD came up with a plan to put more power in the hands of our consumers, the residents, to turn around their developments through our perestroika, perestroika proposal, Congress appears to be saying no, arguing Ooh. we should continue with the inflexible and morbid top-down management approach. Mr. Chairman, I know Congress wants to join with this administration and say we're sick and tired of these bureaucratic monstrosities and we're going to do something about it. Today is not too soon to begin. The leadership of you and your committee members would be a good beginning. I appreciate your interest and you affording me this opportunity to testify and of course be, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Schiff. Will you just sketch for the committee your career path? Mr. Chairman, I served on the Hill as a, uh, started my senior year of college, I went to American University and served as first a gopher for a congressman, then as legislative assistant. I left there for the Army, came out of the Army, went to law school at night while working in a family real estate company, put in 15 years in the private real estate industry. I served seven years as the deputy county executive of Jefferson County, Kentucky, which is the county that encompasses the major city of Louisville, Kentucky. From there, I became the manager of the Kentucky HUD office, where I served for three years. I came to Washington in April of 89 as a special advisor to the Secretary for Public and Indian Housing, was confirmed as Assistant Secretary in August of 1990. Thank you very much. Uh, so you have been in this job for how long? I've been Assistant Secretary for almost two years. Two years. Many of the questions I'm going to ask you predate your tenure, so don't take them personally. Of course. Okay. How do you explain the fact, Ms. Secretary, that HUD has been providing federal subsidies for public housing units in Philadelphia that have been demolished some for decades? I can't. I can tell you this, Mr. Chairman. In September, I assume it was September, of 1990, because we traditionally announced CEP grants in September. In September of 1990, in the CEP grant that was an issued to Philadelphia at that time, we set aside spell out, spell I'm sorry, out. It's the Comprehensive Improvement Assistance Program, which is the modernization money. Yes. And also, it's used for management improvement items that might be needed in a housing yes. authority. We set forth a $350,000 amount for an assessment of the scattered tight situation. You were questioning the amount earlier today. You know, why would you need $350,000 to go and look and count? You know, is one there or is not one there? A very valid question. The answer, Mr. Chairman, is that it was not merely a count of missing units. We still do not believe that 495 is an accurate number. It is a number that was produced by the Housing Authority and sent to HUD in May of 1991, as I believe it was Mr. Payone testified earlier today, but we still have reason to question it, which is why there is a request for proposal on the street that was issued, as my understanding, within the last two weeks by the Philadelphia Housing Authority, because we want an independent source to, first of all, survey and determine by sight, is there a unit or isn't there a unit? Second of all, to determine are the units occupied, are they vacant, are they demolished, or what have you. Thirdly, in phase one, we want them to determine the physical condition of each unit so that we have some idea of the repair requirements for each of those 74 or however many hundred units there are left in Philadelphia Scanner Type. Phase two was to categorize the units by physical condition and frankly, to determine the viability of continuing operating those specific housing units. 
Phase three was to develop options, a modernization or demolition strategy, and to, to come forth with a game plan for what do you do to these units that are, as the IG testified, in such decrepit situation. Should they continue under PHA management? Should they be placed under private management? Or should they be sold to the residents of the Philadelphia Housing Authority? So it is more than a contract merely to count the units. It goes into what is the condition of the unit and what should be done with those units. Well, just counting them would be sufficient to determine the phony subsidy number, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Okay. But not to solve the total problem. <clears throat> Some of the public housing agencies on HUD's most troubled list have been there for years. Yes, sir. Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, some others. I think those two have been on the list since 79. Why isn't HUD more successful in removing these cities from the most troubled list? And how many public housing agencies do you remove on the average every year from this uh, delinquent group? For a number of years, it was a very static list. Uh, nothing seemed to be added to it. Nothing seemed to be deleted to it. That has not been the case in the last 12 months. In the last 12 months, and I don't mean to leave anybody out, but I may, just because I'm You removed from San memory, Francisco. We've, the two most recent were San Francisco and Los Angeles. Los Angeles. That was last month. Yeah. But prior to that, we removed Columbus. We removed Tampa. We removed Bridgeport. It was on the troubled list. And I believe in Dade, I'm sorry, in Dade County, Florida, Miami. Miami, Florida. Those were all removed within the last year. We've also added to the list in the last year. Jacksonville is a agency that was on, off, and is back on. Springfield, Illinois has been added to the list. Kansas City, Missouri was added to the list um, and several others before the implementation of FEMAP. In this new assessment program, frankly, we'll be adding a number of other agencies to the list. Now, since both Washington and Philadelphia have been on the list for a long time, why didn't HUD do the required annual management reviews? I'm not familiar with the requirement for an annual management review. But when it are your colleagues familiar with it? Is there, an an is there a requirement of an annual management review? No, Mr. Chairman. Should there be one? Of a troubled housing agency? Yes. I, I don't believe so. I believe the current requirement of having quarterly reports under a memorandum of agreement and meetings on those quarterly progress reports should give the department sufficient monitoring of the progress of the agency. Under the FEMAP system, when an agency is first designated as a troubled agency, there must be a coordinated management review done as soon as possible, no later than a year, I believe, from their designation. And that should provide, if not in addition to existing information, a blueprint on what needs to be done. But, but thereafter, I think the, quarter, the quarterly monitoring under the MOA should provide sufficient monitoring and feedback for the department. There is an annual assessment, Congressman, of how an agency is doing, but it is not the in-depth type of study that either the IG did in Philadelphia or is in the process of doing here in D.C., or that we would do in our coordinated review that Mr. Janus spoke of when it first becomes troubled. But so there is no requirement for that sort of in-depth annual review because we do it quarterly. Perhaps we may be getting lost in all, all, of our, all of our different terms. Under the FEMAP system, there is a yearly assessment under FEMAP mm -hmm. of the authority's performance under the indicators. That could be interpreted by some as a yearly management review. There is a yearly FEMAP assessment, but it's not, as Secretary Schiff said, an in-depth management review of the entire operation, all the functions. Well, earlier today, the Inspector General testified that D.C. hasn't had one for three years and Philadelphia hasn't had one for five years. Mm -hmm. So presumably they are using the same terminology I'm using. Yes, they are, sir. Okay. Now, in 1991, Secretary Schiff, 
HUD gave the Philadelphia Housing Authority its largest grant ever, more than the agency requested. I believe some $84.5 million. 84 point something, yes. Why would HUD do that when the agency has been mismanaged for so long? Mr. Chairman, if the money had been given to the agency as previous monies had been given to the agency, it would, it would be an absolute irresponsible action by the department. But that was not the case. What occurred was we surveyed the physical situation in Philadelphia, found it decrepit, as you have heard today, determined that major change needed to be made. So what we did is we rewarded them, yes, with an extraordinary sum of money tied to the fact that every nickel would be spent through a construction management contract that we, the department, not the Philadelphia Housing Authority, but we, the department, would have the right to sign off on so that we were assured that an appropriate private construction company was involved in overseeing the expenditure of that money. I think it was responsible action on behalf of the residents of the 20 or 17,000 occupied units in Philadelphia. Well, Mr. Schiff, you earlier heard the chairman of the authority in Philadelphia, Mr. Seidel, testify that uh, he asked HUD to intervene because the Philadelphia Public Housing Authority could not manage itself. Is that correct? You heard I him heard say him say that. Yes, sir, I did. Is that an accurate statement? I am not aware of the press conference that he was talking about when the Brophy Committee began. I'm just unaware of it. I don't read well, the Philadelphia Inquiry. Leave, leave the press, press conference. To the best, of my, to the did best the, of my knowledge. Did the initiative come from Philadelphia or did the initiative come from HUD? For the appointment of the special master? Yes. The initiative came from, from the department, sir. Well, that's diametrically opposed to what we just had testimony to. Yes, it is. Well, let me pursue this a bit. Sure. Taking the, the most kindly interpretation one can, how could Mr. Seidel testify that it was his initiative, Philadelphia's initiative, to bring about the takeover of HUD, by, uh, of, of the agency by HUD? I do not. And you are now testifying to something which is diametrically opposed. Yes. I do not believe that Mr. Seidel had any way of knowing about internal HUD conversations that was taking place primarily between Mr. Smirkanish, who is our regional administrator in Philadelphia, and myself. He had no way of knowing about those conversations. I understand On May that. the 18th, he made a public statement that HUD should take over the Housing Authority. On May 20th, we did. From his perception, he may say, I precipitated that action. The conversations with Mr. Smirkanish on taking over the Philadelphia Housing Authority preceded the call by Mr. Seidel for our intervention. Sure. And the point is, he did not contact you, to the best of your knowledge, or any of your people. He, this was a public pronouncement that you may or may not have read about. Mr. Smirkanish, being honest with you, Senator sure. I, or Congressman, I know was aware of Mr. Seidel's feelings. Okay. Whether he had been contacted by Mr. Seidel is something you'd have to ask either Mr. Seidel or Mr. Smirkanish. Gotcha. Thank you. Well, assuming goodwill on everybody's part. Mm -hmm. And you remember the Latin proverb, magnis spiriti sepe conveniunt, great minds often meet. Your mind and, and the chairman's mind just met between May 18 and May 20, and the thing happened. Why didn't HUD move a year earlier, or three years earlier, or six months earlier? I mean, accepting the fact that both of you came to the conclusion within that 48-hour time span, this is the time to move. We did not come to that conclusion within the 40-hour time span. Well, we you've came been to the working conclusion on previous it. to that. Yeah. But, but, but the basis of okay. your question is why not sooner? Yeah. Which is obviously a, a, a legitimate question. I can't speak prior to my coming to, to Washington. Yeah. Uh, when I was a field office manager, obviously I was not in that, that loop. I can tell you that we were impressed. I shouldn't say we. Let me speak for myself. I was impressed when the comptroller of the city of Philadelphia, one of the highest elected officials in the city, 
appointed himself to the board of the Housing Authority, an elected official that obviously serves at the will of the people and was willing to take the responsibility for the oversight of that authority. A new executive director was brought in to play. This was in, I think Mr. Seidel testified it was in April of 1990 that he came in. Mr. Payone came in in the beginning of May of 1990. I took my position as Assistant Secretary. I was confirmed by the Senate on Friday the 13th of July. I hope there's no significance to that. There is. But, <laughs> thank you. But uh, I, I believe that there was some chance for Philadelphia to turn around. We, in September of 1990, tried to send a strong signal by linking all of the CF that year to construction management companies. Last winter, we became so upset with the Southwark development, uh, a, a Taj Mahal type of, of redevelopment of a very important piece of, of real estate, that we took over responsibility for that. It was not until this winter, and I can't give you the exact date off the top of my head, Mr. Chairman, but when we implemented the FEMAP program, we also implemented a portion of the 1990 Affordable Housing Act that gave us the authority to take over a portion of a public housing authority. Up to then, we had to either take over the whole thing or nothing. And we took over a portion called Southwark. That still didn't work, so on May 20th, we, have, we appointed a special master with the concurrence of the board. Over many years, there have been IG reports laying out all of the problems with Philadelphia. Uh, couldn't have HUD done much more to see that those reports are implemented? In past years, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can tell you this, that this particular secretary, whenever I have gone to him with a horror story like we find here and said to him, I recommend X, whether it be that we go in and we say we're going, you need to terminate this executive director or whether we go in and say, as we did in Philadelphia, there needs to be a special master. Mr. Kemp's response, and I can almost tell you word for word what it almost always is, do the right thing. If he doesn't say those words, it's other similar words that lead to the same conclusion. He's been very supportive, but he's very hesitant. He doesn't like the idea of federalizing a lot of public housing authorities. Frankly, we could go in and declare, in effect, a martial law type of action and take over any housing authority in America if they're in violation of the annual contributions contract. But that's not going to solve the problem in the long term. We could hire someone that wears a blue cape and has a big S on his or her chest and they could straighten out the agency. But if they turn it back over to the same environment that created the problems in the first place, we're going to slide right back downhill. So there's got to be a systemic change. Well, there may also need to be some philosophical rethinking of this whole issue, because what is obvious is that at the local level, in some cities, certainly in Philadelphia, there is a political morass which seems not to be amenable to local management. And the federal people who come in are less under the local pressures than right. the people in Philadelphia. So I'd like you to speculate, since we certainly don't want to hear many more Philadelphia stories. That was a pun, Chris. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> won't you and uh, Jack Kemp may have to re-examine your aversion to a federal takeover when in fact the federal entity seems to be the only one insulated from the morass of the local political infighting? Mr. Chairman, we're justified in where it will do good. I can assure you we will take an appropriate action. Well, that's not good enough for me. I'm asking you to address this issue in an analytical fashion. It's I not good enough to say where in your judgment it will do some good you're going to proceed and where in your judgment it will not do some good you won't proceed. I won't buy that. That's not good enough for me. What I'm really telling you is that maybe Philadelphia or Washington, and I will not name any others, are so deeply 
involved with local problems of a political and management nature that you will not be able to solve the problem locally. That the local public housing authority will be institutionally incapable of dealing with the problem. Mm -hmm. It's reasonable to assume that in Philadelphia over the years there are a lot of well-meaning people who just couldn't hack it. They couldn't hack it because of all the political pressures. pressures. But if someone appointed by the Secretary of HUD comes in, he is not subject to the local pressures nearly to the same extent as local political figures are because he takes his marching orders from Jack Kemp. Now I understand you don't want to federalize and I don't want to federalize. But sometimes you have to make a judgment about the goal which is to provide decent public housing to thousands of people and to see to it that the federal tax dollar is properly spent. Well, the federal tax dollar surely wasn't properly spent in Philadelphia for years, and the tenants are living in rat-infested dungeons. Mm -hmm. well, that cannot be a good solution. No. And, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're absolutely correct, and that's why we appointed the special master. The problem, though, is once By the way, why didn't you appoint a, a, a management consulting operation rather than a special master? I mean, c couldn't you have gotten a, a management contract operation in? We could have. We could have done a number of things. What we're trying to do, though, Mr. Chairman, is to experiment with a number of different models. One of the things that I said in the opening statement that I believe very firmly is that there is not, as I put it, a cookie-cutter approach to resolving the problems of troubled public housing authorities, and that each particular city has its own dynamics. The special master that we attracted, and we interviewed a number, but the special master that we ended up hiring, <coughs> excuse me, is a man of outstanding credentials who operates a $50 million I'm not questioning real estate yeah. operation in yeah. several states, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. The, the, the real thing, though, that, that I'd like to come back to, if I can, is this need for systemic change, which has led us to propose this year a proposal that we call perestroika, which is basically giving more power to the residents of public housing, a total restructuring in those agencies that are troubled for at least three years by giving the residents the power to in effect opt out, to say they're doing such a lousy job that we either want to change management companies and hire a competent management company that we choose, or to go even more extreme, which requires a higher vote of the residents, to say that we want the property sold from this incompetent bureaucracy to another entity that will manage it on our behalf. We believe that there's fundamental flaws in some of these large, troubled housing authorities. Like you, I, sh I shuddered this morning when you asked the question of the IG, when are the other 10 reports going to come out? And he said roughly, as I recall it, two a month for the next few months. Well, Mr. Connors and his folks are doing their job to the best of their ability. I've got no criticism. What I shudder about is not that they're issuing them, but what they're going to say. What they're going to say, because we have got some cities that have housing authorities in this country that are incredibly inept at best. And we need to deal with them on a case-by-case -case basis with the specifics of that particular community in mind. I'd like to ask a question about the security force issue. Philadelphia Public Housing Authority is spending $6 million on security about. Yes. Does HUD have any guidelines with respect to the efficient utilization of a security force? What we say is that when a public housing authority is formed, in Philadelphia's case back in 1937, by statute a cooperation agreement has to be signed between the city and the housing authority. It says that the city will provide comparable services to the housing authority as it does to the rest of the community. In today's day and age, obviously one of the most important comparable services is security. We expect each and every community to providing the same services to public housing communities from their local police departments as they would to any other neighborhood on, a, on an as-needed basis. In some communities, and Philadelphia may well be one of these communities, there is a need for even more security than comparable services would provide. And therefore, having a 
housing authority police department may well be an appropriate action. On the other hand, binding people to desks and not allowing them to respond to a resident in need if they see a resident in need makes no sense to me whatsoever. But the mere fact that they've got a police department may well be justified. That wasn't my question. Okay. You have criteria for spending HUD monies, correct? Yes. But you don't have any criteria, as I understand it, on spending HUD monies on security. No, not to that level. No, we do not. Well, may I suggest, with all due respect, that that's a gap that better be filled? Okay. I mean, what you are telling me, Mr. Secretary, is that you're giving Philadelphia money to XYZ purposes, and you tell them how to spend it. And they have to report back to you. And they have to meet certain criteria. But then there is one piggy bank called security money, where you don't give them any guidelines, criteria, standards. There's, there's, there's two potential sources of funding for security in public mm -hmm. housing today. One is through their operating subsidy. They can take a portion of the operating subsidy. And we do not give them criteria, Mr. Chairman, that says specifically how they have to spend their operating subsidy. The second source of money is through a program that the Congress funded starting, I believe, in 1988, which is the Drug Elimination Grant Program, that this year is being funded to the tune of $150 million or $65 million. In that program, if Philadelphia or any other community gets one of those grants, then we have specific guidelines on how that money is spent. They will be applying for security, for example, and they will be telling us exactly how they intend to use those dollars if they are awarded that grant. But yeah, as far as operating subsidy, no, we do not have specific guidelines. Yeah, that grant, by the way, came out of our subcommittee's hearing in Westchester. We appreciate that, that very that, much. That, uh, well, it was long overdue. Congressman Chase. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I really only had one basic question, and that was, since 1979, uh, this housing authority has been on the trouble list. and, and uh, I was going to ask, when did you decide to, to um, to basically take it over, and um, and why did it take so long? I, I think it's very plausible your response that you know you had a controller who decided to be part of this process, and you saw a new executive director come in. But what what happened is that things, at least it appear from the IG's report, actually got worse. Mm -hmm. um, you've answered that question, but what you've opened up is. Um, the fact that, that, you know, I mean, if I listen to um, the Inspector General, he, he basically said, we don't have a process to track uh, and keep tabs on these local housing authorities. He's saying that in terms of the HUD Central. Mm -hmm. And he said it's pretty bad. And, uh, you know, there's a lot in there that we could probably spend some time talking about. But you also said something that, that opens up what is obviously a concern of, of both the chairman and mine, and that you said a lot of housing authorities are incredibly inept. And that I guess what I think I hear you saying is that if you decided to put Philadelphia under federal control, that that same logic could apply to a number of others. Is that basically a... Um, I don't think I said a lot. I said a number of particularly large city PHAs right. are inept. Particularly lo uh, large number. No, yep. a particularly large city PHAs okay. are, are inept. There, are there many? Pardon? Are there many? We have at this stage of the game 21 firm members of our troubled housing authority list. That will grow, as I said, through the public housing management assessment program. What we have done, Mr. Shays, and if you don't mind, I'd like to spend a sure. minute on this because I think it's an extremely important subject, is February the 18th we publish an interim regulation that sets up for the first time ever a scorecard on every housing authority in America where we will have a rating of how they are doing on a performance basis. It's not a compliance system, it's a performance system. How are you performing? Yeah. How are your vacancies doing, rent collections doing, operating reserves, utility expenditures, so forth, and so on. The, this system will over time give us a trend on every housing authority in America. We've got some housing authorities that you or I would call basket cases today. And hopefully, 
Peru. Is, is basket case worse than incredibly inept? About synonymous. Okay. Uh, I can use other adjectives also. But uh, what this will give us over time is the ability to intervene way before they reach that stage. And I think give us the early warning system that we've lacked for the first 54 years of this program. I see it as a major change in how we're able to oversee and exercise that responsibility that we have of housing authorities in America. We have been for too long sending staff out to do reviews merely because X number of months or years has passed when they're not even needed because the housing authority is doing a fine job. And in exchange, they've been sacrificing and not spending time with the lesser performing agencies that they need to be spending their time on. Do you have the resources to, to implement this plan? I believe we do. Um, I believe that we are stretched to the nth degree. And I may change my mind, frankly, Mr. Shays, once we have fully implemented FEMAP and I see how many troubled housing authorities we have. Well, but at this time. I'm sorry. But this time what? At this time, I believe that we're okay. Okay. Uh, do, do you have the, uh, the computers to do this? Do you have, have you got the programs now implemented? Uh, the computer programs implemented to do this? I'm assuming that... Yes, there's a computer program that they can utilize to implement FEMAP scores to do the analysis of FEMAP. Yes, there are. there are. There are computers not on every desk, although there's a plan within the next 12 to 18 months to have a computer on the desk of every field office employee throughout the department. Whether we'll be able to achieve that, of course, will depend upon funding that we receive for when, next fiscal year. When we work with GAO to, to work on an urban... Uh, a, a, an urban Marshall Plan to rebuild our cities, and we wanted to have a pay payment in lieu of taxes for public housing. It, it was interesting, really, what HUD had available and what it didn't. And it, I was struck with the fact that the record keeping of HUD is is got a lot of problems. I and, agree with that. Yeah, and um, uh, it just seems to me, though, so obvious that that we should be able to, and you should be able to tell us exactly how many units uh, are in every community, how many. Uh, how many are vacant, how long it takes to fill a vacancy, how much it costs each public housing unit on a, on a per unit basis. And I'm, I get the feeling that that is not information that right now can be readily uh, provided, that you, you have to go and look at records and it's not all... You're, you're, you're correct. After FEM FEMAP is being implemented, Congressman, on the basis of the PHA's fiscal year. So they don't all come in at one time, they come in at four different yeah. quarters over the course of the year. When we finish the process, will be, which will be in January, we will then have the type of data in our computers that you're talking about. We had a retreat for the Office of Public and Indian Housing. We went across to a GAO conference room, or not GAO, um, GSA, a GSA conference room across the street just to get away from the phones. And we sat down. We are trying to work on the development of an executive information system, so we'll have that type of data. whether. You, you, the Congress, wants it, or whether we need it for management purposes, it would be available. And frankly, there's a lot of data that we need that we don't have today. Right. We do not have. You're absolutely correct. But are we working on it? Yes, we are. Yeah. The Secretary is committed to a five-year data integration plan that our Chief Financial Officer is heading up that will totally revamp the HUD data systems. Yeah. They need help. I'll just conclude by saying uh, we, uh, we don't have to uh, be brain surgeons to know that we see a lot of public housing in our various cities that are in pretty terrible condition. But, I mean, if this is, if the, if the audit report on, on Philadelphia mirrors uh, what we would find in a lot of other cities, the, uh, the idea of uh, incredibly inept housing authorities or uh, housing authorities that are basket cases that would not be the uncommon uh, occurrence. And... Um, uh, I'm told that uh, the ones on the trouble list amount to 20 percent of the total funding for public housing. Is that? Uh, I, I think the actual figure, sir, is 18 percent. Okay. The the reality is what you've got is the 21. Let's just talk about that number because that's the solid number for now. Represents two thirds of one percent of the housing authorities in America. Yeah. Yet they operate 18 percent of the units receive, I believe it's about 24 percent of the operating subsidy in, a, in an even larger percentage of the modernization funds. So from where the people live, they represent a, a significant percentage. As far as though the total number of public housing authorities in America, they represent only, as I said, two-thirds of one percent. You can't just look at it and say it's two-thirds of one percent, therefore it's not important. 
because they're, some of them are very, very large authorities. 23,000 units in Philadelphia. I think it's 11 or 12,000 units here in the district. So they're very significant housing authorities. But what I don't want to do is I don't want us to walk out of this room today thinking that 98 percent of the housing authorities are in the same situation as Philadelphia. That's just not true. Okay. Well, it, it's not true, and yet I'm kind of haunted by the fact that almost in every community, uh, whenever I see, um, you know, on TV or, or um, I'm reading about a housing authority, uh, there are just too many places where we know that the living conditions are pretty deplorable. Absolutely. And um, I'm also struck, uh, I just had not focused in on the fact that a community like Philadelphia might have anywhere from 100 million to 150 million in their budget to 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 funnel to uh, you know to serve the the, the residents but uh, there's a lot of money there that if not properly handled um, is it represents could represent a tremendous am amount of waste to the federal government can i relay a story and i don't think i'm breaking a confidence mm -hmm. that uh, mayor rendell relayed to me he came down and i believe if i'm not mistaken it was a few days before he's actually sworn in is Mayor of Philadelphia, but he wanted to establish a relationship with the Secretary from the very beginning. We had a very fruitful meeting up in the Secretary's office and I was privileged to participate in that session. He then went back to Philadelphia and said he doesn't know how it occurred, but there was a banner headline in the Inquirer that said PHA to receive one billion dollars over a ten-year period. hundred million dollars a year for ten years added up to the, to the figure that the the inquirer used. He later told me, about a week or so later, that he has had he had had more interest in PHA than anything else in the city of Philadelphia. It was sort of like a honey he didn't use this words, but my words are it's like a honeypot existed. Yes. And he said that there were more people interested in employment and in contracts with PHA than he could possibly have imagined. He said not one of the persons that called him was interested in the well-being of the residents of PHA, but they were sure interested in the patronage potential that PHA could spin off. That is an unfortunate story in too many housing authorities. They've been looked upon as not our money, it's the Fed's money. What do we care about the Fed's money? Well, we care a heck of a lot about the Fed's money. This committee, the department that I represent, and I resent, frankly, the people that are out there trying to rip off the system. Well, are can, we trying to take action? Yes, we are. I can tell you this. I mean, I think that last comment is just a, a nice summary to this hearing, or a bad, uh, an Say accurate it. summary, but uh, a, a very alarming one. But uh, I spent a great deal of my time trying to to oversee uh, and protect <laughs> the housing authorities in the 4th Congressional District from the very kind of comment you make, where the housing director might call me up and say, I'm getting pressure here, I'm getting pressure there. And, uh, you know, and then I have to make phone calls to various mayors to say, you know, I'm, I'm, I think you need to look into this. But um, I guess it also says to me that uh, th 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 this is worth a lot more of our time and attention uh, than we've given it to date. I'm delighted, Mr. Chairman, that you conducted this hearing. I really can, I'm very appreciative that you have, and I thank our witnesses. I thank you, Congressman Shays. Uh, um, Secretary, we were very pleased to have you and your colleagues. Uh, look forward to working with you on a very cooperative basis for a long time to come, as we have with Secretary Kemp. Um, I want to thank both uh, the minority and majority staff, our most able recorder, and, uh, and all of you for being here. This uh, subcommittee feels an enormous moral obligation uh, to the clients of public housing. Uh, these are people who desperately need our support and attention and protection. And they're going to get it. We also have a tremendous fiduciary responsibility to the American taxpayer and that uh, they will get it. And I hope that um, you and I will be able to meet when this uh, list of uh, troubled agencies uh, will have uh, zero communities on it. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.